housekeeping rules before I start off. Um, and the first thing I want to say is in relation to the meeting that we had on Thursday with Sony, um, there was, there was uh, people saying about censorship, etc. I can assure everybody, nobody was censored. The discussion that we were having related to the consultation on the proposals on the transmission plan and not on another utility regulation report. And unfortunately, we were we were veering away badly from what the original what the original uh, meeting was set out for. Uh, nobody was censored, um, and uh, uh, it's regrettable if you feel like you war. So I can certainly assure you, um, when I'm in the chair, it's always fair. Um, housekeeping tonight, mics will be left open until somebody steps out of line, and the first person, regardless of who they are, steps out of line, the mics will be locked. No exceptions. Uh, matters horizons will move to after item 9.2.1, and items 7 and 8 are for information only, so I will leave them to after correspondence. Thank you. Okay, councillors, uh, we'll start off on the agenda, and the first item on the agenda is apologies, and we will go to uh, the group leaders, and first of all, we'll go to councillor Tommy Maguire. Uh, uh, two apologies from the Sinn Féin group, and councillor Stephen McCann, councillor Catherine Kelly. Thank, Thank you. you. We will now go to councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. One apology, councillor Wilson. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will now go to Councillor uh, Paul Robinson. Chair. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, sorry about that. Councillor Robinson and Councillor Elliott will be joining later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mary Garty. Thank you, Chair, and good evening. One apology, um, Victor, from Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you. Okay, no problem. And now we'll go to the single member parties and independents. Is there any apologies from any of those? Councillor McAleer. Sorry, yes, Chair, um, just to apologise on behalf of Councillor Keenan. I think with work commitments, he's unable to attend this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will move on uh, to, uh, as I said, matters of raising uh, is staying to after um, five, uh, 9.2.1 uh, and we'll move into the reports for decision and the first reports of the regeneration and planning report reports and that the first one is 5.1 to consider update on business case report. Kim. Sorry, before we go any further, I forgot declarations of interest. Uh, uh, Councillor, um, can I come in? It's Catherine Kelly. I'm actually in attendance tonight. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at Tommy here a bit strangely. I've just realised Tommy put in a, uh, or, uh, an apology for you, so okay. Um, we're having a little bit of IT problems here, so we'll keep going. Yep, we'll keep going on uh, this declaration of interest. And the first person up is Councillor Mary Gardy. Thank you, Chair. I think just one item 7.1 is a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Uh, okay, next up we have Councillor Emmett McAleer. 
Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, item 5.6, as a member of Greencastle St. Patrick's GA Club, um, item 7.2 and 7.3, they make reference to Southwest College in collaboration with the college as an employee of the college, and item 7.6 in relation to the Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board as a member of that group. Thank you, Chair. Okay, next up we have Councillor John McClory. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm uh, 6.2 and um, the Council's rep on Fermana, Community Advice for Mana and uh, 7.1 the planning. And whilst I'm declaring an interest in 6.2, from uh, that organisation hasn't had any meetings in quite a while and I'm sure the other councillors might have some concerns around that as well. Okay, next up we have Councillor Barry McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just 7.1, Chair, as a member of the Planning Committee, but I'm making a judgment that I don't have to declare an interest for 7.4 or 7.5, where there are related you know, planning matters, but just a declaration of interest for 7.1. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Councillor John Coyle. Thanks, Chair. 7.1 uh, as member of the Planning Committee. Okay, next up we have in the chamber we have Councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, 7.1, sitting on the Planning Committee. I, I would reiterate, I think, what Councillor Michael Duff said, 7.4 and 7.5, whilst they directly relate to planning issues, uh, they're so generic, I don't think we have to declare an interest, and I think our input probably on the discussion in those regards would be useful from the members of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go any further, can I check uh, who Colin User 2 is, even though I already know? Colin User 2. Councillor Sean Clark. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we'll go now to Councillor uh, Tommy McGuire. So, Margaret McCarley, uh, just to declare an interest in 7.1. Okay, we'll go back to Webex and um, Councillor Donald Coffee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 6.2, as I sit on Fermana uh, CAF, and 7.3, as I sit on Fermana Council of Trade Unions, which is now involved in the Labour Market Partnership. Okay, Councillor Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item 7.1 as a member of the Planning Committee. Okay, thank you. Councillor Alan Rainey. 7.1, Chairman. Planning. Thank you. Earl, are you coming into for the same 7.1? Thank you, Chair. It keeps going off and on here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, declaring that trust in 7.1 as a member of the Planning Committee and 7.6 as a member of the Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board. Okay. <clears throat> Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. 7.1 planning, Chair. Okay. Uh, back into the Chamber, Councillor Anthony Feely. Thanks, Chair. 7.1 member of the Planning Committee. Okay. And finally, uh, Councillor Deanna Armstrong, and she wants to raise a matter as well. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Just a declaration of interest at 7.6 as a member of the Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board. And uh, good evening, Chair. Thank you for, for letting me speak. I just wanted to acknowledge today is International Women's Day. And I'd ask members to remember the women of Ukraine as they flee their country, as they flee their livelihoods, their jobs, and in many cases, their families and menfolk. Um, I think we have to send our good wishes and our support to families who are fleeing uh, the, the bombings by the Russians and also to remember the Afghani women who now are no longer able to have an education and have work um, as a result of persecution again. So I just ask members to remember them, to have them in their thoughts today on International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, is it? Yes, yes, it is, Victor. Uh, um, thanks a lot, to um, Diana, for bringing that in. And no better um, s sort of um, quote or a line or whatever, j just for the scene of International Women's Day. There's a huge amount of suffering going on throughout the world, and there's no doubt 
that um, the Ukrainian women suffer and suffer really bad. Um, I was at an event today that um, an Oma community house with a Syrian woman who has been brought in to our area this last couple of years through war conflict as well. They held um, International Women's Day today. I attended and they were very emotional because you know what, they're just going back into what they have actually had endured and have come through and are still living with the consequence of it. Quite, quite traumatic incidents. And they are also through Oma Community House, the Syrian women are asking for members of the public to gather up sanity products, deodorants um, or, or wash products, put them in small plastic bags, individualise the stuff into sort of like family members and if they could leave it off at Oma Community House, they're hoping to have a drop of um, ladies products going out at the end of the month because they said that's what they were desperate need of. There's a lot of um, nappies coming across but they were saying on food but women's sanity products um, so sanitary towels and that is a huge need along with deodorant and a toothbrush and toothpaste. So um, on that and as well as the um, Afghanistan women, like we have women in Palestine and everything who has and the M&Es and there's a huge amount of people over there. So solidarity for everybody worldwide going through conflict at the minute. But and um, we really couldn't pick one worse than another. So thanks a lot, Diana, for bringing that to the table. OK, Councillor Bernice Swift. Maggot, Kahirluk, and yes, thank Diana for bringing uh, in the support today and the solidarity for all of the women who are suffering in the Ukraine. And as Amory's after saying, women right across the world who are oppressed. I too attended a wonderful event today about the, today's theme, this year's theme on the campaign, which is about break the bias. So trying to create a gender equal world, a world free of bias and stereotypes and discrimination a world that is diverse, equitable and inclusive and great readings and excerpts from strong, independent women right across the world who did make a difference to the lives of other women. So together, of course, everybody we, collectively, we can break the bias. And uh, I, too, want to send out my sincere support and sol solidarity to all the women who are suffering today in this world and like to work together again to break the bias. Gurumangat. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. I echo the, the sentiments of what's been said before. Um, obviously, bearing in mind as well the meeting that we had on Friday, I think it would be remiss not to mention the, the women of Palestine who are being forcibly evicted from their homes uh, by the Israeli occupying force and by settlers from other countries. So I think it's important that we do recognise them. In our own district, I think, too, we have to recognise the the, the women that are out on strike, whether it be the education welfare officers who I was out with on the, the education authority this morning, or the UCU workers or any other workers who are taking action. Obviously, every family is enduring financial difficulties and financial hardships at this time. Um, so it's important that we do remember that closer to home. And again, in my own DEA, the families and the, and the women of the communities that are standing up to foreign uh, mining interests and being persecuted for doing so. I think it's vitally important that we do send solidarity and good wishes to all of those on this very important day. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I would like to thank Councillor Armstrong for, for uh, bringing this forward at an early stage in our meeting, especially on International Women's Day. Um, it is a great institution, Chair, a day uh, uh, when we have an opportunity to reflect on the place and role of women in our society and the great struggle that women have had uh, to uh, help them achieve their full potential and end discrimination uh, against women throughout the world, where, wherever it may be. But certainly, yes, as Councillor Armstrong has said, we we are moved to tears and heartbroken at the images on our television screens of women and children fleeing the conflict in Ukraine and uh, their uh, bereft husbands and partners behind uh, trying to do what they can to defend their countries. I also need to make mention uh, of the past year in which we have seen uh, violence against women and girls. And I think that we should remember all the victims uh, of uh, domestic violence and abuse, those who have lost their lives. And uh, 
uh, times when we have really been uh, uh, moved in such a way as to protest uh, publicly, uh, such as the tragic uh, death of Ashleen Murphy. So I think it's uh, fitting that we should remember all those women on this day and to continue to strive for equality and justice for women throughout the world. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Deegan. Okay, that's everybody. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we will revert back to actually item number two to sign the minutes and confidential meet minutes of the previous meeting on the 8th of February. That's already been done. Uh, we've had all the declarations of interest, so we'll move on now to item five. And 5.1 is to consider update business case report paper A, and it's over to Kim. Thank you, Chair. So this report uh, outlines one business case for which approval is sought, and the business case is for the Grange Master Plan. The project seeks to improve amenities available at the Grange Park, including accessible public conveniences, enhanced access to the town centre through the Riverside Walk and Cycle Path, and complements the plans for the destination play park in, in the Grange Park. There are, there are a range of different elements of work, and the indicative budget for the project is £712,340, uh, for which there is appropriate financial provision in place, and it's recommended that, that the Council approves the business case in respect of the Grange Master Plan. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, it's uh, a very encouraging project, and I think the, as noted in the report, the the inclusion of inclusive uh, public conveniences and the stressing of accessibility and safety throughout the report is very encouraging. Um, so I'd be minded to to propose the note and progress with the the actions as noted in that. Could I just maybe clarify our query because I believe there was a a meeting in relation to this, and unfortunately I wasn't able to attend just due to the timing of it. But can I ask the question just of the the director? What has been the the disability advisory group involvement to date, just in relation to that, and have they been kept up to speed on it? Thank you, chair. Yes, Chair, the, the project has been led by uh, the Environment and Place Department and there has been engagement um, in respect of the development of the project with a range of stakeholders, including the Access um, uh, uh, the Access and Disability Advisory Group. Okay, thank you. Councillor Michael Duff? Yes, uh, Chair, can I propose the adoption of the recommendation? It's already been proposed, uh, Councillor Michael Duff. Do you want to second it? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I'll just maybe refer to one aspect within it as well. The creation of an accessible link path to the Riverside Walk and Cycle Path, providing a connection to the town centre. That's very, very important. Now, I appreciate that there is ongoing work taking place in that matter. There's no fault on the part of our officers. It's, it's being progressed. But just maybe to add in in the, in the short term, on, in relation to the Riverside Walk, if we could have signage, signage on the Riverside Walk, which has been requested for some time now, because people are confused about where they're going. So just maybe revisit that at the next Environmental Services Committee, the signage for the Riverside Walk itself. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor McIlduff, that'll be sorted. Okay, um, thank you. Next up, sorry. If I could maybe just comment on that. Um, the, the signage... Planning in terms of wider signage, including for the Riverside Walk, is going to be considered as part of the OMA Place Shipping Plan uh, so that we can develop a, a consistent and comprehensive uh, approach to signing uh, of paths throughout the town. Okay, and, the, and, and I would be referring to you, Chair, till signage on the Riverside Walk, which is directing you till Hunter Crescent, Hunter's Crescent, or directing you till Strathroy. People tend not to know where they're going on the path. I walked it myself yesterday and it would be very easy to be confused. But thank you, Kim, and thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Deacon. Thank you, Chair. And of, of course, Chair, I want to add uh, my voice of support for this recommendation. Uh, I think uh, the Grange Master Plan is an exceptionally exciting project and one which will uh, deliver great benefits not only, not only to Oma Town, 
but also as a destination playground uh, for the whole district. Um, I welcome in particular uh, the upgrade of the public conveniences, uh, especially with improved accessibility. And also, Chair, uh, uh, pursuing the uh, green environmental agenda, I do welcome uh, the uh, provision of um, charging for electric uh, vehicles. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Errol Thompson. Thank you very much again, Chair. I'm not going to repeat what others have said. Uh, I do welcome it, the Greens Master Plan and everything involved with it. And I I was one of those who took up the opportunity to avail of the meeting that took place and the briefing that we had on it. So it's very much to be welcomed and uh, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald. Yes, thanks, Chair, for letting me in. Yeah, um, I was the same as other councillors. I did avail of the meetings and um, but had meetings with the residents as well. Out in that area, who had a few concerns and I must say that the officers had come forward and has made um, better um, recommendations from that ongoing. But just, um, I think everybody else had mentioned about the footpath connecting up. It's a brilliant idea, and I think it's going to be a well worthwhile um, element of it. But I know the residents had issues maybe with the path and um, maybe flooding of that area and with the drainage pipe going into the river. So that's just something brought forward. But our officers are very well aware of it. And um, for the extra parking, um, I think would be a huge bonus to that area because we'll have something sort of like the Gunch or the, the Gorchin Park. We will have huge numbers. So I think additional parking would be very, very good. So yeah, very supportive and um, thank um, all the officers and all the workers for the great work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Matthew Bell. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just yes. Um, so kind of like Councillor Thompson said. Um, and no, no point in rehashing what's already been said. But just to voice my support, um, I just want to make a comment on the the accessibility in terms of um children with maybe um disabilities. And I know I noticed in the in the plan that we were briefed on, um, that is being included within the plan. So that will be an excellent addition. Um, to the to the Grange Park, and it looks like it's going to be fantastic. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more speakers. So you've heard it proposed and seconded. Uh, is everybody happy with that? No dissenters. Thank you. We'll move on to item five point two, and that's to consider update report on funded po programs, uh, paper B. Thank you, Chair. So this report uh, provides an update in respect of the formation of a Fermanagh and Oma Peace Plus partnership, the Tripsy Rural Business Development Grant Scheme for 22 to 23, and the Tripsy Forest Park Enhancement and Community Trail Development Scheme also for 22 to 23. So firstly, Peace Plus. Um, the Peace Plus programme covers six themes uh, which have been outlined previously and the Theme one is around building peaceful and thriving communities, and uh, this will be taken forward uh, through local community partnerships and the delivery of a co-designed local community Peace Plus action plan. And our funded programmes team have been engaging with uh, SEUPB and the uh, consultants consortium engaged by SEUPB towards the establishment of the Peace Plus partnership uh, and also taking forward plans for consultancy support to begin the work of engagement and development of the action plan. Appendix one to this uh, report outlines a proposed partnership framework for the establishment of the Peace Plus Partnership, setting out the proposed composition. Um, and there are four pillars. Pillar one uh, would uh, include 14 elected members. Pillar two, five statutory bodies. Pillars three and four then would also include up to 13 social partners. We yet have to have have to receive confirmation of the financial allocation to the council and we don't yet have the call guidance document however we anticipate the call will open in may or june of this year and councils are being encouraged to now begin the process of forming partnerships so that they're in a state of readiness to begin uh, to submit their, their plans it's anticipated the peace plus partnership will remain in place up until april 2027 and partnership meetings will take place on a monthly basis so it's proposed that the elected member representation in Peace Plus would be 14 members. And this is in line with the elected member representation on the existing Peace 4 partnership. And at the annual meeting in 2019, the council agreed the allocation as outlined in respect of the positions and appointments to the Peace 4 partnership. 
and it suggested that given Peace Plus partnership um, is, we're suggesting 14 members also, that the same composition uh, across the, the party groupings is retained for the Peace Plus partnership. That would include Sinn Féin five members, UP three members, DUP two members, SDLP three members, and independence one member. In terms of the Tripsy Rural Business Development Grant Scheme, that scheme is funded by DERA um, and administered through councils. We have run the scheme since 2019 and uh, we're now contributing a business case to DERA for a fourth scheme, which will be delivered in the 22 to 23 year with a proposed budget of £140,000. Applications will be invited from micro enterprises based in rural areas for up to 50% funding towards capital equipment and e-commerce websites. Uh, costs of projects between 1,000 and 20,000 and available awards ranging from 500 to 4999. And uh, subject to, to a letter of offer, we're seeking approval to progress that. In terms of the Forest Park Enhancement and Community Trail Development Scheme, this will support recreational infrastructure projects in rural areas that address social isolation, health and well-being and access issues and is funded at up to 80% by DERA with a minimum contribution of 20% from councils. It's recommended that the council submits three expressions of interest for those projects uh, and the schemes uh, that are in, in an appropriate state of readiness and meet the criteria are at Loch Navarre in Derry Gonnelly, Ecclesville, Domain and Fintna and Loch McCrory trails. Uh, officers continue to engage with partners and local groups to support potential project development for future rounds of funding. And these include at Sleeve Bay and Seskinor Forest Park. So the recommendations chair are that the council approves the attached framework for the Peace Plus partnership, approves the suggested allocation of positions as outlined at paragraph 216, and that group leaders confirm their respective nominations. Subject to receipt of a letter of offer from DERA, we approve a 22-23 Rural Business Development Grant Scheme and administration within the financial year and also supports the expressions of interest for Loch Navarre, Ecclesville Domain and Loch Macquarie Loch Trails to the Tripsy Forest Enhancement Community Trail Development Scheme. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. First up, we have Councillor Podrigan Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, delighted with this report and want to thank the officers uh, for being involved with it. There's a lot going on and um, can only be good news for everyone involved. Particularly want to mention the Lot McCrory Trails in Lot McCrory and welcome that. And I know I've been working with the officers in terms of Seskinore Forest Park and helping to get that shovel ready. So I'm um, delighted and thanks very much for all the hard work. Are you proposing the recommendations? Happy to propose, yeah. Okay, thank you. Next, we will go to Councillor Mary Gardy. Thanks very much, Chair. And on the outset, I just I second the report and just like Father Bain, I welcome it and uh, um, hope, hopefully we are successful in our endeavours. I've just one question and the previous speakers um, touched on it and where I think it was assess Kenor development i know there has been talks and communications between a community group there that gave a good presentation to many of us and i think there is potential there i was just wondering just in case because i will be asking the question i think they were keen that we would have pursued the tripsy money um for that project and i know it might have made the criteria for whatever reason i was just wondering why i am very welcome of the whole report but just why it didn't come forward at this stage if kim could just elaborate because i know that's the questions that i'll be asked um following the meeting and um, kim just briefly thank you okay thank you for that thank you thank you councillor uh, in terms of seskinor the proposals really are, are at a very early stage without planning permission and the costs require further refine, refinement. In addition, the land in question is Forest Service land, and um, we have no plans at this point to acquire an asset of that scale um, in terms of our asset policy and also in respect of general audit advice. So that's something that will need to be um, considered as, as we work that poten the potential up in respect of that project. Great. Thanks for that clarification there, Kim. Thank you, Chair. Okay, next up we have Councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm happy to see these going forward and generally I'm in support of all the four recommendations. Though I do have a query, I think, on the third scheme, uh, Forest Park Enhancement. 
and possibly Kim, it's a couple of schemes. We seem to have a propensity now to take on additional responsibility in regard to forest service the state. I've, I've emphasized this before. Um, my question, first of all, our questions are, the money streaming down from Diera, is it capital or revenue? Um, our 20% uh, support, is it capital or revenue? Um, second question, have we actually taken this into account in our estimate setting for the incoming year? Or we'll just set the rates. I would also ask that in any type of scheme going forward where there are capital grants, and this is a proposal, Chair, that any paper coming forward to us for decision in regard to uh, grant streaming down where we either have no contribution or do have a small contribution going forward. What is the revenue implication year on year for the council? Um, I would like to know because I, I have a funny feeling with this one, there is no revenue stream coming with it, but there is a consequence once it actually goes forward um, in regard to what the council has to pick up and I'll caveat that. We, we had discussions um, recently in regard to rate setting, in regard to additionality of staff for the incoming year for various things that we have taken upon ourselves or decided to do. What I would not like to see is issues like this coming forward where indirectly we will have to provide additional staff going forward to actually supervise, maintain, or look after. And we have no real indication at the time that that is going to be a consequence. So my proposal, basically a backtrack, is that any proposal from officers coming forward in this regard should have an attachment showing what the revenue stream is and where the revenue stream has to come from. And a light to that, the likely impact in regard to staffing levels. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm that the DERA funding would be capital and our associated contribution would be capital. Also, any revenue costs would need to be accounted for and considered in the business case development for specific projects and then uh, those revenue implications would need to be carried forward into service budgets and and estimate budgets they should also be outlined if we if we have any implications in respect of additional human resources um, or asset acquisition in the in the uh, reports which are coming through to committee um, already uh, and i take your point in terms of particularly in respect of forest park enhancements, that Forest Service have a policy where the, the transfer of the license would only be to local authorities as opposed to community groups, and then that places an implication on, um, the, on, the, or, on the council as an organisation in terms of ongoing maintenance uh, and other implications associated with that asset. So that is something that needs to be borne in mind in terms of um, working up future proposals, for example, at, at Sescanor and at other sites where we don't currently hold those assets. Okay. Next up, we have Councillor Bernice Swift. And thank Kim for uh, allaying some of those concerns there. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm very happy with this entire report also. Um, and it is great. I think that the expression of interest is being submitted to the Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Fund. Um, particularly, I'm going to speak just for my own area here, Loch Navarre Development Plan. And we did receive um, a vision for the future of the Loch Navarre Development Plan through our Geo Park Committee. And uh, it's just uh, outstanding, to say the least. Uh, the whole development plan was completed by the Outdoor Recreation 
uh, on our behalf and everybody was fully supportive even indeed on that day so again it is great that the vision is presented and can be fully developed as well uh, and the financial assistance necessary will be provided towards the development for construction in our area to enhance the entire tourism uh, product Gurmagat. okay thank you councillor anthony feely Thank you, Chair, and, and I'll be brief. And, and thank you, Kim, for the report. This uh, piece of Peace Four was one of the groups I sat on, and I always enjoyed it. I'm glad to be and become a member. Please plus and be still on it. And as, as, as Bernice says there, I'm coming in on, on Loch Navarre as well. It's right beside me there as well. And great home. Um, we have great potential there on the forest drive and, this, and the scenery from the top of it. So more money can be spent on it to enhance it the better for our, our community. And people coming to visit it there as well, like the crowds that used to come there. During COVID was 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 um, serious fear crowds coming. And we'd like to see that continue. So I'm just glad to see it. I'm glad to see the uh, uh, interest in Loch Navar. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong. Chair, yes, I just want to come in to uh, second the proposal made by Councillor uh, Councillor um, <laughs> Irvine. <laughs> Sorry, I had a, a bit of a pause there um, regarding the revenue streams to examine going forward. Um, where they come from and the likely impact with regard to uh, staff levels. That's uh, to second that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Alan Rainey. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I would really want to welcome the, the report as well. Uh, perhaps in my neck of the woods is uh, the Ecclesville Forest Park and Enhancement Scheme. And I had the privilege of having a conducted uh, tour of the work that's going on there towards the end of last week. And uh, uh, the work has been phenomenal. Uh, that has gone, been able to be carried out, particularly with the weather conditions that we have had and the timber uh, has been all uh, uh, failed and uh, hauled out to the, the uh, to the roadway for for pickup. I I think it's somewhere in the region of thousands of tons of timber that uh, has been uh, salvaged there or or or, or harvested, and uh, they're going ahead with the, the planting scheme. That's the most important uh, end of it, uh, to have it replanted and coming on. No doubt it is maybe like a battlefield uh, at this minute. However, uh, with the young uh, saplings, if we can get them planted now, particularly early in the spring, and they get off to a good start in, in a few years, then it'll look an entirely different place. And together with the enhancement of the, the bridle pathways for the horses uh, at Ecclesville, that's so much sought after, uh, together with, with the walkers uh, from the town and surrounding area. Uh, maybe I would want to uh, I would want to register my 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 uh, my disappointment that. Uh, Seskinor hadn't been as successful as what uh, we would like to have as had it to be. Uh, so much uh, hot air has been uh, spewed out over a good number of years about Seskinor and the great potential that it has and would have and all the rest of it. Uh, but it uh, was lacking in a, in a, in a group to come together to put forward a proposal and uh, on their behalf uh, I, I'm sorry that it, that it hasn't uh, just met the criteria but it's good to see it mentioned and uh, perhaps with a little more work done and more persuasion and uh, whatever uh, whatever can be uh, whatever further uh, information that can be sought for, for as a way forward that'll be uh, welcomed and i do welcome 
the work that has been done to date, and I hope that in the not too distant future that we will see uh, it flourishing there as well, because it has a really terrific potential. All of that there. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, uh, I haven't listened to uh, Councillor Rainey and the others previously there. It's quite clear that this, these are very um, important and uh, significant uh, developments and the investment that we're making is hugely grant aided effectively. So I think um, it's important that uh, these proceed. In relation to the <coughs> proposal by Councillor Irvine, while I understand the, the point he's making, uh, I do note uh, that the report already states that there are significant uh, equality, good relations, sustainable development and rural pr proofing benefits accruing from these investments. Uh, and if we are going to look at the, uh, the costs associated with uh, staffing over time, I would like to propose that we also have estimates of the benefits in terms of the, the non-monetary, but also the wider monetary benefits in terms of increasing footfall, tourism spend, and also the potential efficiencies that are associated with uh, our staff uh, being able to make the most of a new investment, which may actually save uh, some efforts and perhaps time. So I think it's important that we have a holistic approach to things and not always see every investment or commitment as a negative uh, that, you know, potentially uh, a cost, but there are actually benefits associated with this sort of really progressive investment, as as, as we've just heard there from Councillor Rainey, who says is, is transformative. So I'd like to propose we have a balanced approach, including details of the positive aspects of these investments, as well as the cost. Thank you, Chair. Okay, next up, we have Councillor Glenn Campbell. Councillor Campbell. Looks like you're having. Can you hear me okay now, Chairman? I hear you now, yeah. I just can't hear. Sorry to hear me. Yeah. We can, we can hear you, yes. Apologies, apologies. Uh, my sound just wasn't playing ball there. No, well, I mean, I would want to certainly, I would want to emphasize the positive aspects. I do think that uh, when we look at the cost involved in, in these sort of partnerships, um, uh, we can be, um, you know, I think relatively speaking, the cost uh, absolutely has to be taken into account. But uh, in terms of the, the benefit, I think it's very good value for money. Any investment we can make in facilities such as, you know, um, Sescanoa Forest, uh, Ecclesville Centre, you know, th this is not going to distract from, from larger projects in the district. Uh, this is going to, in fact, feed into them. It's going to bring people uh, closer to nature and, and you know people are going to use them and uh you know and, and i think that we should look at the positives in terms of health and everything else so i would echo the words of councillor rainey and others uh, in support of that and, and really urge our officers uh to work closely with everyone in the community that that wants to drive those uh projects forward and uh, and um but apart from that I, I welcome the sort of the efforts of officers to date uh, in that regard and, and accessing funding to support such projects Thank you, Chairman. Okay, Councillor Michael Lear. Thank you, Chair. No, I think this overall this report is to be welcomed and I suppose be mindful of the Ecclesville project and also Lock Macquarie and my own DA, I would be supportive. I'd just like to second uh, Donald's proposal there. I think that's entirely sensible that we do get that balance um, because I think the, the proposal or the potential investment and benefit to our district and our different DAs will be tenfold the, the investment that's gone into it and the money spent on it. So I would be more than happy to second uh, Councillor Coffey's proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm going to bring in Kim. Thanks, Chair. I suppose just to note in terms of, of reporting back on, on the projects and the information that comes through, um, the business cases associated with all of the projects will 
assess the monetary and non-monetary benefits and, and implications. So when we're bringing projects forward with an approved business case, um, that, that information has already been, been considered and determined in respect of the entirety of the, of the project, and that would be implicit in the recommendation that we're bringing forward. Okay, we'll go back to Councillor uh, Irvine's proposal and seconded by Councillor Armstrong. Um, has everybody agreed with that or is there any dissent? Okay, that's passed. And then we'll go to Councillor O'Coffey's proposal, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Is there any dissent on this? Okay, both passed. Move on. Next, we have item 5.3, and that's to consider a report on the Sleeve Bay Partnership Paper C. Thank you, Chair. So this report provides members with an update on the Sleeve Bay Partnership and seeks Council approval to progress identified recommendations. And uh, the partnership has met on three occasions. It has, in terms of its progress, it has issued an, a number of items of correspondence, as outlined at the top of page two. It has met with the Chief Executive of ICBAN regarding funding opportunities and has extended an invitation to the uh, Dr Rory Sheehan from the CAN project. Officers have progressed work to collate and map the visitor product within the Sleeve Bay area, and FODC officers have also secured funding for an initial Sleeve Bay walking festival, which will take place in March of this year. Uh, in relation to a scoping study around recreation and associated infrastructure opportunities, the Sleeve Bay Master Plan uh, outlines in its action plan uh, a couple of actions in related, related to paths and signage namely condition survey, path design guide and phased improvement program alongside a wayfinding strategy and signage public art, uh, the latter of which were to be led by the community and business sectors respectively. Sleeve Bay Partnership is seeking a contribution of £5,000 from each of the three respective councils to progress a scoping study in that regard and discussions have taken place with the council's countryside access team and it's considered there would be opportunities to improve the recreational path provision and associated infrastructure in the Sleeve Bay locality. There would be potential also within that study to identify proposals for associated signage and interpretive art provision in conjunction with community and business partners from the area. Third item then to be considered in respect of Sleeve Bay partnership is regarding the Bith Bronze interpretive art sculpture. Uh, there are a couple of actions in the action plan which refer to signage and public art with lead partners identified as local business and local government in conjunction with a number of other partners. A Bith Bronze interpretive art sculpture has been installed in the Monaghan County Council District and the Sleeve Bay Partnership has uh, asked to replicate this across the three constituent council areas. In the Fermanagh Noma District it's proposed that a sculpture would be located at Carnmore Viewpoint uh, located on along, along a short circular path on licensed forest service land, uh, which we already hold a license for. Officers understand there's been no community consultation regarding the site or this aspect of the project, and the council may wish to consider whether such an exercise would be beneficial. As far as we are aware, location in the Mid Ulster District has not been identified, and at present there's no commitment from uh, the Mid Ulster Council in that regard. Uh, further to a report presented to committee in October 2020, council officers have continued to investigate land ownership issues, uh, commenced a PAD discussion, and Monaghan County Council has confirmed that sculpture moulds can be made available and it's understood we don't have any copyright difficulties. There was an indicative cost of £40,000 previously estimated for the sculpture, um, and but at this point full assessment of that has not yet been undertaken and that will be dependent on final site selection. The Bally Bay Clonus Erin East Partnership has proposed that the installation of the Bith Bronze sculpture in the Fermanagh Noma District is fully funded by Fermanagh Noma District Council. In consideration of this request, members should note that all public art provision within Fermanagh Noma District Council since 2015 has been progressed with funding from external partners. To date, council officers have not been able to identify external funding or part funding for the sculpture project. However, there may be an opportunity in respect of the scoping study, which uh, which has been outlined um, at part 2.2 of this report, um, to develop a proposal for public art alongside this, the paths and infrastructure upgrade. 
So in terms of the financial implications, Council funding has not been allocated to any specific project in respect of the Sleeve Bay Master Plan. And while an indicative cost of £40,000 has been estimated, this will need to be revisited and um, members will be aware of the increasing costs of materials and labour since that uh, initial indication or estimate was developed. Financial provision is not, uh, has not been made within this year's estimates, or the 22-23 estimates, and if Council agrees to fund and progress the project um, in terms of being fully funded by the Council, then consideration will need to be given to an appropriate budget stream, and that may require a review of existing commitments uh, alongside development of a business case. Funding of £5,000 could be provided from the Countryside Access Budget towards a scoping study, and that, that would be available from existing budgets. Um, so it's recommended that the committee notes the update from recent meetings of the Slave Bay Partnership, approves a contribution of £5,000 to undertake a scoping exercise of potential outdoor recreation projects, subject to confirmation of similar commitments on the part of Monaghan County Council and Mid Ulster District Council, and considers the request from Bally Bay Clonus Ernie's Partnership for Council to commit to funding for the Bith sculpture at Carnmore Viewpoint to allow the scheme to be progressed. Okay, thank you. First up, we have Councillor Seamus Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I won't uh, be voting on this issue as I'm a member of the Slee Bay uh, Partnership, but uh, just uh, on a few uh, things. Uh, when this was originally the Slee Bay Master Plan was being suggested, I think it was as far back as 2000, late 2015, maybe 2016. Uh, the master plan was uh, uh, got completed. The fifth sculpture uh, was uh, being proposed that it would be put up in the two council areas at, the, at that time. In early 2019, Monaghan County Council put theirs up on Bragg and Mountain. Um, we are now in 2022, and as of yet, uh, it hasn't been put up in Fermanagh. So after a joint collaboration with Monaghan uh, County Council, uh, our side of the Slee Bay Master Plan, as it was then, uh, still hasn't even got the, the, the starting uh, brick uh, implemented, which was the, the, the Bith uh, sculpture. And as I said the last time, uh, when when we be dealing with Monaghan uh, Council and some of these things, and and I understand, and I'm not giving anyone uh, a rub here, and I I I presume it's it's just that we are set up differently, but they seem to be able to uh, uh, go on fairly quickly with all uh, anything that be proposed and get it done, where we just seem to struggle to get it done, whether for funding or for funding from outside bodies or whatever. And it really does be very frustrating when you're on these partnerships and uh, just nothing seems, everything just drags on our side uh, for one reason or another. Uh, but, and as I say, that sculpture still uh, still isn't up. But anyway, I'll say no more about it. And as I say, I'm on the Sleep Bay uh, group, so I won't be voting. Or anything on this, so I won't propose this here because I'm on um, that. I'll let somebody else. Okay, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think first of all, I, I I had chance to read this, and I have to say, I I was not uh, well educated about Sleeve Bay. Um, I learned a lot about reading uh, uh, about this area. It's a cross-border area. I think the idea is clearly uh, valid to have like a, a such a strategic development idea. Uh, you know, an approach to make a real improvement in the area. Uh, it's very ambitious. There's a lot of uh, themes in this which are very interesting. The dark skies. Um, I know some references perhaps to, uh, you know, developing a cultural, um, you know, attractions and, and uh, that would obviously relate to the, the rich uh, archaeological, uh, you know, uh, remains that are all, all permeate that area in general. Um, 
I have to say, though, uh, at the end of it, when I saw all these uh, huge, uh, significant enough budgets are being identified in this document, and you come to the end of it and we see £5,000 commitment um, to take something forward, and, and then when you hear Councillor Green explaining how projects have not happened for years, um, it does pose very genuine questions, and <clears throat> I just would like to find out, uh, th this seems to be from reading it, a very grassroots up, a grassroots up uh, approach to development, uh, everything that we should be supporting. Um, and I'm just wondering why uh, it doesn't seem like the projects that have been identified in it have really been taken forward in the way. And I'm just wondering, as, as someone from very much outside of that area, uh, it was it was actually very, uh, it was one of the best documents I've read in a while. Um, I, I thought it was very, uh it, you know involved uh multifaceted holistic all those things you want and yet the delivery end of it you just have to question um five thousand why are we not doing more on this thank you chair okay uh do you want to propose the recommendations councillor coffee i i'm i'm happy to propose them as they stand but my question really remains thanks chair. okay no problem do you want to answer that question kim Thank you, Chair. Well, Sleeve Bay Master Plan was uh, brought to Council in July 2018. It, it's not a Council document. This, uh, as Councillor Coffey has said, it's a part, it's a plan which was developed um, by, at, at a ground uh, grassroots level with, uh, led by community and others. And the actions that are identified within the plan um, have a whole range of lead partners um, including communities, businesses, uh, and other statutory partners. Um, there are there are, uh, a small number of actions to be led by local government, but this is this is a partnership plan, um, which is not directly our responsibility to lead. And the Sleeve Bay partnership was established and met for the first time in in late 2021. Um, recommendations are being brought forward uh, to to committee today, and we are. Um, proceeding to commit resources in, in terms of infrastructural development in that area. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, again, as, as someone from outside the area, having read the report and listened to, I suppose, the, the input from a local councillor and the, what, what's been uh, what's been read or what's been stated by the the director. I'm I'm a wee bit concerned, um, kind of along the lines of what Councillor Coffee has raised, and, and again what Councillor Green has raised. In real, I I understood there that that the director said that there hasn't been consultation in relation to the erection or design of the sculpture, but yet uh, Councillor Green's input seems to kind of contradict that. And again, the time frame of when this was, I suppose, originally discussed and when it became. Uh, a group or when it became a formally presented to council, there seems to be quite a lag there. I, I, I would have some similar questions in terms of why, as Councillor Coffey says, this is the sort of project we should be promoting. You know, we're we're supporting local tourism, we're supporting community involvement, we're supporting these, you know, these three strands of, of council to promote the local environment, to promote the economy and this seems to tick all the boxes. And I think it's great that it's coming from the community that it's not been put on the community by an external body. I'm kind of worried why why this hasn't been progressed to date. And I, I suppose maybe for clarity, Monon County Council, they've paid for their, the sculptor on their end, I'm presuming. Was it always proposed that it would be the council would, would fit the bill for that? Or um, was there discussion at any stage that it was to be a number of associated bodies that were going to contribute? Um, and, and I really finally I'd like to know, considering we, we have raised the rates again this year, we raised them last year, we've raised them again this la, this year, why why hasn't this project been budgeted for? Because as I said previously, it seems to tick all the boxes in terms of the, the council programme. Thank you, Chair. As I've identified, the, the Sleeve Bay Master Plan is not um, a, a council plan or strategy the part if you if members review the 
action plan, which is outlined from page 48 of the document, you will see that there are a range of projects. Um, those are concept ideas uh, in terms of the master plan, which require development. And there are a range of lead delivery agents, uh, including um, a range of partners. Um, and I'm just trying to identify the, the specific pieces in relation to, to public art uh, as well. Uh, one of the public art um, actions is identified as in the master plan itself as being led by local businesses, um, uh, as well as uh, another reference to interpretation signage and art led by local government. So there are a range of partners here uh, beyond beyond local government um, in terms of, of the, the delivery of the plan itself. In respect of consultation on the public art uh, project, I understand from Councillor Green's comments that there was initial consultation uh, on a Beth Braun sculpture. I'm not aware at this stage that that would have been in terms of a developed proposal uh, identifying the specific site and all of the arrangements. And if it was specific to the project itself, members will be aware that in terms of any public art proposals that are brought forward, there's also there is always um, specific public consultation on the installation and provision of public art to ensure that um, it's acceptable and welcomed by, by local communities. And that, that would be the approach that we would take in respect of all public art uh, provision in the district. Okay, thank you for that, Kim. Okay, we've had a proposer. Can I have a seconder, please, for the recommendations on that? Thank you, Councillor Curry. Uh, well, you've heard it proposed and seconded. Is everybody happy? Okay, we'll move on. And uh, next on the agenda is. I could seek clarity, members. Then, part three of the recommendation is to consider the request from Bally Bay Clonas Ernie's East Partnership to commit the funding for the Bith sculpture at Carnmore Viewpoint. Um, can I seek clarity in respect of the the proposal in terms of the way forward on that point? Chair, I was happy, uh, content to proceed with that. Chair. Sure, I'm just not sure what's been decided there. I was going to come in on the back of it, but I'm just not sure what's been decided. The um, proposal was to consider. What means consider? I think contain, it contained in the report, and we have to be cognitively aware, all three councils that input into this partnership provide admin backup at appropriate level the whole way down. Uh, so there is actually a financial commitment from the council to support and guide, where possible, the partnership. I think the um, director has uh, highlighted at page 48 that local government on all three councils are merely part of the input mechanism into the partnership. And a lot of the, the work is coming from the community as well as other partners. I think in regard to the signage, it would appear that um, Maybe Monaghan have actually uh, budgeted for that, but we don't have budget for it, and it wasn't coming forward in the previous couple of years to do that. The commitment was trying to source public art funding outside uh, direct funding from local government, and that's the policy direction that we actually do as a council, that if we're going to do any public art provision in any of our projects, we look for external funding from it. We don't draw down from our own resources. So we use our officers actually to try and source that funding. My consideration of this request would be that we continue to source external um, rev uh, sorry, streams to provide the partnership with the funding stream for the um, project, but we don't actually directly pay for it out of our resources. We haven't budgeted for it. 
and therefore we shouldn't be committing. And there are other issues coming up in the, the paper tonight that deal with extraneous uh, demands on our resources. And reference has always been, has already been made to, we've gone through an estimate project and we've actually set the rates and we've determined actually where our resources are committed for the incoming year. Uh, and therefore we should be very aware that when we make additional proposals and requests and demand on our officers, that there should actually be a dedicated budget for that, that we shouldn't be trying to pull the rabbit out of the hat to fund projects on a whim and um, a gift. So unfortunately, my interpretation of consider is to further look for external resources to actually fund this, not to be drawn down directly from our own reserves. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether you let me in there, Chair, or not, but it came up to as unmuted. So, Chair, I, I can't hear you if you're talking. I think he said Terrell and Thomas. All oh, right. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear Victor there at all. So, um, it, it, just to clarify on the partnership, there seems to be kind of a, mis uh, a misinterpretation of what the partnership is. The partnership is made up of the three councils. Uh, now, the, the consult with outside bodies, but it is made up of councillors from Mid Ulster, uh, Monaghan and for mana and uh, the administration is made up from monaghan uh mid ulster and, and for manoma so uh, it, i think uh councillor Ir irving was uh kind of uh thinking that we were only a, a kind of a, a bit part as the council uh in this partnership uh to me we are the three lead members of the partnership uh in my estimation and just come back to the Bith uh, sculpture. In February 2020, I made a proposal at uh, because of how slow it was on our side to to uh, to get something done. In February 2020, I made a proposal on the uh, 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 Bally Bay Clonus Air and East Partnership to that the council. Uh, would fund this so that we actually could catch up on the council. Now, this is it has took to now for this to actually come to the chamber. Uh, uh, but as I say, I'm a member of that partnership, so I never could raise it in the chamber. But just for clarif clarification, I'll raise it now. That was February 2020. It's now March 2022, and it has finally come to the chamber. Well, I think uh, I'll just come in there briefly. I think part of the problem obviously was February, discussed February 2020. Unfortunately, then a few weeks later, we kicked into COVID and there was very little done for quite a long period of time with the 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 Ernest uh, Valley Bay Clonus Partnership. Uh, so I, I, I would say there was an effect there, certainly. Um, no, but that proposal was made at it, so it was up to the well, council to. I, I'm not sure if a proposal made at that group, you know, really came over on to our full council. But I, I don't want to prolong this any any longer uh, because Councillor O'Coffey is looking in again, and Councillor Irvine. If I let you in, I want you to be very brief, Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to clarify, uh, when I pro proposed this, uh, I was uh, I was happy enough, obviously, with the commitment to fund this uh, 
you know, the, the, this is a relatively small thing. I do note from the uh, the the paperwork that uh, alternative sources of funding have been already, as uh, you know, a look for, and it's not easy to come by. I don't see why we should be holding forth on this. This is literally, uh, I know it's it, nothing's insignificant, but we spend a lot more than this without as much consideration. So I'm happy that uh, just if there's any need for clarification, I'm happy that we would pay our, our contribution to that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Irvine. Well, sorry, I, I, I can't agree with the sentiments uh, expressed there by Councillor Coffey in regard to this is a small amount and we do this with, with other things. I, I also would um, take Councillor Green up on uh, what authority does he have to act on behalf of the Council uh, as a representative of the Council on a partnership to actually put a proposal forward that the council body will commit to doing work, whatever it is. Uh, I didn't think we had delegated that level of authority to an individual councillor or councillors to decide on behalf of the corporate body to commit resources that we as a corporate body haven't talked about. Uh, uh, beggar's belief, I'm sorry, Chair, um, but maybe that's just a misrepresentation of what Councillor Green is trying to say. If it is, uh, I apologise to him. If it isn't, where did he get the authority? Where was it noted at full council that he could actually decide on behalf of the council what to do with the ratepayers' money? Uh, I, I can't agree to this. I'm sorry. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just coming in to second Councillor Irvine's proposal that we seek external funding for this um, and that it hasn't um, been included in our estimates for this year. Thanks, Chair. Councillor O'Reilly. Chairman, you know, I, I am highly surprised here uh, that you let that go, uh, Chair. Nobody is putting forward that uh, any one councillor, you sit on that, Bally Bay Clonus Ernie's Chair, uh, nobody is saying that any one councillor is proposing anything, and I'm highly offended that Robert is trying to smear Seamus like that. Uh, Seamus is not, that was a proposal put forward by the Bally Bay Clonus Ernest partnership as a partnership that is made up of the of the uh, council here. Let's not forget, there is no other outside people on this other than councillors in Monaghan and uh, Fermanagh, Oma. So this is very much a council sort of run, uh, facilitated by council officers from both councils here. So this was put forward by the partnership to be brought to the relevant committee in this council. So, and you know, I am very, very annoyed, Chair, that that was let that that sort of attitude there by Robert was facilitated here because he knows far better than that. Uh, and nobody was saying Seamus was doing this off his own bat. And you know, Chair, because you, you were at the partnership meetings, this was put forward by a partnership to the relevant committee that, that the partnership goes through here, which is this committee. And then that is decided at this committee and, and obviously ratified, uh, you know, so I just wanted to make that very clear on those two points that Seamus is not doing this. He is the only one speaking on this to try and drag it forward where it was left in abeyance and notwithstanding COVID and all the rest, it's still taken a long time. And it is when we go to those meetings and the councillors on the Monaghan side are sitting there saying, well, here, look, uh, it was proposed and agreed that we would go forward. This Monaghan has now done it, uh, erected it, got the moulds done, got everything done, uh, and they look at us and sort of say, well, what is Fermanonoma's problem here? And we're saying, well, we're, we, we do it actually where we look for outside uh, funding. But that is, uh, you know, well and good, but we have a, a sort of a an imbalance uh, very much in Monaghan looking at us and sort of saying, well, guys, what are you doing? You know, it has taken this amount of time and you still haven't found any money or been able to do it. So it's definitely an imbalance on how we're doing things. But to be very clear, Chair, the partnership is made up of solely the councillors. 
So it is not outside the council. The council very much at the back in Fermanagh uh, council set up this partnership with only councillors on the partnership to be a vehicle for this council to be able to uh, undertake projects and development in a, a cross-border area that has very little and has had very little to no uh, investment. And uh, for Mana Council, definitely, and I would like to believe that for Manoma District Council sees that partnership as a very worthwhile partnership to be able to undertake uh, some development in that in that area. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Sir Curry. Yes, Gurmagadi Kerley. Um, just to just to say a few words on um, today was at uh, Locker and Landscape Partnership. Um, very interesting um, talk there that was given by a gentleman called um, Ed McMahon, and it was on sustainable tourism. And a lot of what he talked about, um, there was a lot of good things in it, and a lot of what we could already identify that was taking place here in our district. Um, but also a lot of opportunities um, for us to build on. And uh, one of the things he spoke about was kind of the intangibles and the experiences and that kind of um, tourism that you can't really put your finger on, but the importance of that culture and heritage tourism, and also about the importance of linking places together and how that can um, benefit you know, can can have just huge holistic benefits as well as, you know, in, in smaller local areas. And I think this is actually an example of that. Um, I mean, the Sleeve Bay area is a big area, uh, but in a lot of ways, actually, it's, it's quite a small area as well. And I know um, the tourism board here in the north look, looking around clusters and, and things like that. And I think this is a great example of just that partnership working on a cluster in an area. Um, and I think it ticks all the boxes. And I think um, I do have to say I am quite surprised at the proposer, um, given that there was no support for even a very small increase on the race this year, given that this council is uh, has bills to pay, cost of living expenses to pay, 1.25% increase on national insurance that we have to pay our workers um, and everything that goes with that um, and writing off um, amounts of money as if they're nothing. And when we all took the time to, to go along to the meetings and have any extra engagement we could have with the officers to make sure that we could deliver um, as low a rate as possible because we're all very conscious of that so i'm surprised at that but i think that um actually this would be a good investment just in that wider tourism part and um, that linkage in our district uh, the gaelic culture there the fantastic outdoors which is something that we have seen an increase in and um, particularly during COVID. and um, so those are my thoughts on it, Chair. I have seconded it, and I'm happy to go with that. Margaret. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a, a proposer and seconder for the recommendations, including to proceed with the Beth Brown sculpture and the funding of that. And we also have a proposer and seconder to continue to look for funding sources. Um, in respect of uh, members' views, uh, and if members are ultimately minded to support the request for funding on the Bath Bronze, then I, I would recommend that members would, within that, uh, include uh, a community consultation exercise in advance um, so that there would be clarity uh, and confirmation um, in respect of, of that. The, the community would welcome the the installation uh, and also that a report would be brought back uh, on the further detailed costs once the um, detailed aspects of this uh, have been have been further developed 
alongside the, the identified funding stream, um, given that we don't have a funding stream in place at the moment and consideration will need to be given to that. Okay. So I'm going to first of all put Councillor O'Coffey's proposal to the meeting. Um, is everybody happy with that? Okay, there's dissent. Okay, Councillor McPhillips. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just like uh, Councillor Green, I'm also a member of Sleep Bay, so I won't be taking part in any vote just for to keep things right. Okay. Okay, a recorded vote has been requested on Councillor O'Coffey's proposal. Uh, yeah, I had my hand up, Victor. Sorry, 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 Mary. Sorry, sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, for allowing me. It's just before the vote takes place. I think from listening to what we all heard, I think this is a very unique situation um, and all speakers have merit in what they're saying. But I do believe um, due to the COVID situation that we've experienced, I think this would have been a proposal that would have come to the, the, the Council at some stage um, with a more substantive um, report. And I think it would have been given the support of the Council um, in retrospect. I do think it's unique the way it has transpired and I do think that uh, we wouldn't be like doing something like this perhaps all the time but I think this is a genuine case of oversight um, and that I appreciate Councillor Green's input I know he's not voting but to give us the background into this it'll certainly help us on our vote going forward thank you chair okay I see more speakers indicating I'm not bringing anybody else in until we do the vote because of already the votes already been called for yeah so chair yes, yes. I declare an interest, Councillor Robinson. Okay, on advice, um, I, I think it would be fair to say then that the, the six members of the the um, Clonus Ernie's Bally Bay Partnership that are on that committee, uh, who are all the Ernie's um, councillors, including myself, so I will declare an interest as well. Uh, Councillor Green has declared an interest. Councillor uh, McPhillips has declared an interest. Um, Chair, just, to clarify, just to clarify, I declared an interest because I was a member of the Sleeve Bay Partnership, not the Valley Bay Clonus Ernie's Partnership. Uh, I'm just being told that the proposal came from the Valley Bay Clonus Ernie's Partnership. So, are you still. The, it's up to yourself, Seamus. Do you want to. Declare an interest? Yeah, I'll declare an interest in that if that, uh, that's the case, yeah. Okay, that's one, two, three, four. Um, Councillor Robertson is five, and Councillor Keenan's not on. Okay, so go ahead. Thomas, do you want in? No, you're just declaring an interest. Okay, go ahead and set the vote up, please. Okay, the vote is now open. So, we you go. Chair, this is Councillor Irvine's for clarity, isn't it? No, this is for Councillor O'Coffey's proposal. This is for Councillor O'Coffey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Ten seconds.
อย่าไทม์ซบโอเค the results are eighteen uh, four seven against four abstained and just want to clarify then that proposal is carried I just want to clarify the proposal and I'll pass you back over to Kim thank you hey, chair the proposal was to uh, agree the recommendations including the re recommendation to proceed to fund the Beth bronze sculpture um, and that was proposed by councillor O'Coffey and seconded by councillor Curry and can I just confirm then that members are content that um, within that we would also conduct a community consultation exercise and that we will also bring a report back setting out the detailed costs when those are available. Okay, everybody happy with that? It took quite a while. Um, we'll move on now to item 5.4, and that's to consider a report on the draft Leitrim County Development Plan, Paper D. So the purpose of this report, Chair, is to provide members with a review of the draft Leitrim County Development Plan 23 to 29, and uh, the report sets out officer consideration of the potential implications for the council area. Written submissions uh, can be made up until 4.30 p.m. on the 27th of April. Uh, the draft plan sets out an overall strategy for the planning and sustainable development of County Leitrim for the next six years, and uh, FODC has been consulted. Uh, officers feel um, that uh, many of the challenges for Leitrim are similar to those identified in our district, and the planning policies put forward in the draft plan are considered to be an appropriate response to these challenges. Uh, the report sets out a number of officer comments and officers would also request Leitrim consult DERA and its role as statutory nature conservation body as it has overall responsibility for designation management and monitoring of European sites if it hasn't already consulted DERA. And it's recommended that the council agrees to submit comments to Leitrim County Council reflecting the views as set out in paras 2.2 to 2.14 of the paper. Councillor Feely. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kim, for that. Yeah, I'd um, like to propose this, um, propose this and just make a few comments about it, as, as Kim says. It's very similar to our, our own area there, and I was reading through it then, I see a lot of similarities to it. You know, about a rural uh, council area, and a lot of emigration in Leitham there, like, like our own county there, like, and I'm fairly close to there on the border. I live only about three or four miles away from Kilty there. The birthplace of Sean McDermott, one of the signatories of the proclamation. So I do have a, a very fondness of Leitham there. And um, I know Manor Hamilton there is not that far away either. And it's on the road from Inniskill and the Sligo. And it's part of that group. I sit on the A4 N16 group. I know we haven't met there, but I'm glad that it's there. And we soon will meet because a lot of investment needed there. And there is another couple of things. I see the mention there, Lock Melvin and Lock Blackneen for tourism issues there. So there's a lot of potential there as well for us working together. So uh, just like to, to propose the recommendation again. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, like Councillor Coffey, fairly fairly good response here. I think that he's, he's right and the officers are right when they draw the attention to the similarities between the two districts. Obviously, Leitrim, <coughs> similar to ourselves, is a, an area that was under threat of fracking and is also under threat of gold extraction. Um, and that's noted on the report, the priority of the protection of tourism assets and tourism development, I think is hugely important. The promotion of our natural heritage and biodiversity is again very important. Important. It notes, as I say, policies in relating to the extractive industries and the protection of landscape character, protection of human health, um, recognition of adjoining land uses, and the amenity value of neighbouring lands and of adjoining residential development. So I think that is all very encouraging in relation to the, the first appendix that attached, again, the promotion of the tourism, the noting of the, the water connection and the, the waterway that's connected from our district to the Leitrim district is hugely important given, I suppose, 
recent developments and the, and the release of the Water Frameworks Directive. Um, there, uh, there's also reference to the um, on page seven of Appendix Two to what's known as, or what's noted as Agress Paul Two, um, which in relation to the extractive industry only permits proposals where such development does not adversely affect human health, the receiving environment, including the visual, visual quality of landscape, existing structure, adjoining land use, and the amenity of the value of neighbouring lands. Um, there's note, just a, a one question that we have just at the bottom of it, um, page 11, one of the maps, figure two, uh, there seems to be a swathe across from the Fermanagh side of the, the drawing there, and, and it's noted as being an area, the area of highest underlying capacity in relation to wind energy and, and wind turbines, wind farms, and that. I'm just wondering, that because that seems to stretch from quite for quite a distance, but the I suppose the area or the names on the map doesn't seem to be particularly legible. So I'm just wondering in terms of our own district, what what area specifically is being identified there, but overall quite happy with the report and, and happy to second it. Thank you. Thank you. I would need to check with the planners chair in respect of the detail of that map and uh, we may be able to enhance that and uh, provide a better copy to members. So if members were content, we can we can share that information following the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Bernice Swift. Yes. And uh, Kim, uh, in the recommendation, there is the opportunity to submit comments to Leitrim County Council. So I would like to make a further comment on the all important uh, part of the town, Kilty uh, Not f It's located in sort of the proximity of Kinloch and Manor Hamilton so there shouldn't be a problem and as already mentioned the renowned 1916 proclamation signatory Sean McDermott hailed from that area of Cornmore and that his house and homestead has been beautifully restored and has been enhanced for much tourist attraction among the whales uh, and uh, also beautiful flora and fauna in that area there's also the historic uh, black pig's dyke and indeed evidence of the border roads impact all of which makes a narrative um, those of us old enough to remember uh, some of that uh, and it is a story that needs to be documented for posterity and for future generations along with creating the, the tourism product as mentioned there in Sleeve Bay like locally and collectively there's lots more that can be enhanced and tapped into and I think it's always so much more interesting for tourists from wherever they come from uh, and not even so far away that the intrinsic character as is outlined in this report is encapsulated uh, for quality tourism so something of such historical importance shouldn't uh, be bypassed. So I would like that comment to be uh, sent to Leitrim County Council to ensure that the importance of Kilty Clahar, particularly Sean McDermott as homestead is most definitely highlighted within the tourism aspect of all of this. Gurmagat. Thank you, Councillor Michael Duff. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a strong interest in Leitrim as a place. Uh, Seamus O'Rourke, the playwright is a brilliant tourism promoter for Leitrim and he said come to Leitrim where you can breathe. That was one of his messages and uh, I just think it's good to see 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.8 and the significant emphasis on tourism. would agree with Councillor Feely and Councillor Swift on the emphasis they've given uh, Sean McDermott's legacy there and to note that there's also a visitor centre in uh, Kilty Clahar as well as the homestead that uh, Bernice refers to and uh, have been there and it's a brilliant attraction but also to commend their approach to for example blue ways and green ways and uh, if I'm not mistaken John our director may have had some professional involvement previously in uh, green ways uh, or blue ways such as the one from from Shambo to Leitrim village that can you know aid us in our understanding of their potential. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And finally, on this, we have Councillor Alex Baird. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, looking at the proposal it mentioned, and I wonder is it just a typo or am I wrong? It says items 2 2 to 214. Uh, uh, item 215, two is that not to be included as well? Should it not be 2 2 to 215? Just for clarity, please. Yes, there's a typo there that should be included. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Baird. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. You've had that uh, recommendation proposed and seconded. Is everybody happy? Thank you. We'll move on to item 5.5 is to consider update report on performance improvement paper E. E Chair, so this report gives an update on our quarter three performance improvement um, progress report uh, for the current financial year and also sets out the proposed improvement objectives for the 22-23 year for consultation purposes and members will be aware this is a statutory requirement in terms of the publication of improvement objectives. Uh, in terms of our quarter three progress update for this year, we have four improvement objectives. There are 15 strands of work with 75 activities and at quarter three, 85% of the activities were progressing in line with the identified schedule and work plan. 10 have an 10 or 14 percent have an, uh, an amber rag status and one percent uh, a red status. In terms of performance measures, of the 32 identified, 22 are showing a positive trend against the baseline, uh, with eight at an amber status and two um, showing a red status at this point in time. Uh, in terms of the improvement objectives for the incoming year, uh, the corporate plan identifies five improvement priorities. And aligned to those, we've identified six improvement objectives, which are outlined on the table uh, commencing at uh, page two. We've set out the six improvement objectives and the associated strands of work aligned to each of those. And the recommendation, Chair, is that we note the quarter three progress report for the current year and we agree to proceed to consultation on the draft improvement objectives for 22 to 23 as outlined. Okay. Thank you for that, Kim. You've heard the recommendations. Could I have a proposal for them, please? Councillor Michael Lear and Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you. Chair. Chair, just very briefly. Okay. Yeah, no, um, happy enough because yeah, the, the issues identified I think are very important and it's great to have some sort of a monitor there just in terms of how we're progressing in relation to them. But just a note and it's contained within the report is just an update or a reminder that the the consultation on the biodiversity strategy is due to close now in 10 days time the 18th of march i'm just wondering if that could be maybe promoted again just within the district or across the district across social media whatever just to to get that out there because i think it is up until 2027 it's going to be a very important document so that as much as we can prioritize that and publicize that uh, any feedback I think we get on it is going to be vitally important so if I could maybe propose that I'm sure the team are already on it but just the the final 10 days if we could make a push on that it'd be great thank you chair okay and you're happy enough to uh, propose the the recommendations as well yeah I'll propose the recommendations okay. that's fine yeah you were seconded by Anne Marie thank you Councillor Curry Margaret Kelly, just a second, uh, Collier McAleer's proposal there, just to put a bit of a push on it. There has been social media promotion of the biodiversity strategy being out for consultation, but I would just suggest maybe just a high impact post. Um, they're very interesting posts, but just maybe one focused high impact post um, just to alert people to it, Gormagat Chair. Okay, you've heard uh, the two proposals. Um, is everybody happy with those? Okay, those are passed. Uh, next, we come to item 5.6, and that's to consider the updated report for the Director of Regeneration and Planning, Kim. Councillor McPhillip, sorry. Thank you, Chair. So this, this report provides an update on requests by Council that considerations given to opportunities to fund community-led capital projects which were not eligible for funding through the COVID-19 Recovery Small Settlements Regeneration Programme and also the establishment of a working group to progress capital projects to shovel-ready status in order to avail of funding opportunities. 
Um, members will be aware that three projects from the approved village renewal project list were deemed ineligible for funding through the COVID-19 small settlements programme as they were located outside settlements. Uh, there was a previous uh, decision at the January meeting of the committee that opportunities were identified to fund those three projects through use of the Council's COVID Contingency and Resilience Fund. Um, just to note, members, that all other projects submitted through the Small Settlements Regeneration Funding have now been successful in securing funding, and we have received a letter of offer in that regard. Um, so, in terms of strategic capital projects, um, officers have advised that the COVID Contingency and Resilience Fund is, is unlikely to align with the provisions of funding departments in respect of funding community capital projects. Um, the budgetary position has been agreed for 22 to 23, alongside a medium-term capital programme running up to 2027, with a projected capital investment in the region of £100 million, um, and significant reserves are earmarked to support that uh, capital programme. The Director of Corporate Services and Governance is also developing a reserves policy, which will come to a future meeting of the Policy and Resources Committee uh, for consideration. It has, however, been identified that there will be an underspend in revenue budgets at the uh, end of the current year, and that funding of up to 1.2 million could be allocated towards a Strategic Capital Projects Grant Programme, and that will be delivered over the 22-23 and 23-24 years. Uh, it's proposed that the maximum grant allocation would be capped at £200,000 in line with that identified through the Small Settlements uh, Regeneration Programme. So the three approved village renewal projects which were ineligible for funding from the Small Settlements Programme were Cannoli GAA, improving and resurfacing the walkway with an allocation of up to of 50k. The Heber McMahon's GAC at Brookborough, and that was for a fitness suite extension to the existing building. Um, with the gymnasium and additional changing facilities and an allocation of 200k for that and Greencastle St Patrick's GAA multi-purpose cultural leisure area and enhancements to the handball facility again with an allocation of 200k. Subject to approval of the suggested allocations outlined a remaining fund of 750k would be open then to applications from community groups for strategic capital projects within the district uh, and those need to be able to be delivered by the 31st of March 2024. And all projects should contribute to the outcomes identified in the community plan for the district and the council's corporate plan. At last month's committee, there was a request for uh, the establishment of a working group to work with officers to ensure the availability of shovel-ready capital projects across the district when funding streams become available. In terms of governance of our capital programme, we do already have an elected member oversight group currently in place, and they are due to meet on the 6th of April. Uh, and at that point, the group will review its terms of reference um, alongside receiving a report on current projects. And that's in relation to the review of the capital um, structures within, within the council. So in order to encourage a streamlined approach to the management of capital projects, and that includes from commissioning stage right through to project closure, and also in light of the significant resource implications which are associated with management and servicing of the wide range of working groups and partnerships which are in place, we're suggesting that the terms of reference for the Capital Programme Oversight Group is expanded to encompass the role in respect of project development and readiness, as opposed to the establishment of an additional standalone group. The membership of the Oversight Group is cross-party, and the membership is as outlined at paragraph 2.2.4, and those members were appointed at the annual meeting in 2019. Uh, in terms of financial um, implications, the allocation of an underspend of 1.2 million to a strategic capital grants programme would be on a one-off basis, with a post-programme evaluation to be completed at programme close to identify benefits and additional value. As this funding has been identified from current year underspends, it will not be a recurring fund. Uh, it will be delivered by officers from the Regeneration and Planning Directorate uh, in association with the wider funding and capital programmes and uh, programmes related to investment in community-based capital assets uh, and efforts will be made to ensure a geographic spread of projects across the district. And members, the, the recommendations are that um, the Council agrees to allocate funding of 1.2 million to a Strategic Capital Projects Grant Programme for the next for the 22, 23 and 23, 24 years. 
that the three approved village renewal projects, as outlined, are supported from this fund, with allocations of 50,000 to Canoli GAA, 200,000 to Heber McMahon's GAC, and 200,000 to Greencastle St Patrick's GAA, subject to confirmation of statutory approvals and the ability to spend on the specific projects by the 31st of March 2024. That a call for applications for community based capital programs within the district is developed with details of the program criteria to be presented to the April meeting of the committee. And that the terms of reference for the elected member led capital program oversight group is expanded to include a project development and readiness role to ensure projects are sufficiently progressed in preparation for future funding opportunities. Chair. Councillor Clark here. Sean. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I, Chair, sorry, I, I needed to declare an interest that I would have a, a connection with one of those GA clubs mentioned. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Councillor McPhillips. Thank you, Chair. I just happy to propose the recommendations. Okay, thank you, Councillor Feely. Thank you, Kim, for that. Kind of all that, yeah, I'll second uh, the recommendation. I'm glad to see this funding coming into our rural areas as badly needed and see extra funding come in for some other projects too. So just happy to second. I'll let somebody else come in on the, the formation of the group later on. Councillor O'Reilly. Councillor O'Reilly. Sorry, Chair. I forgot that I was. Uh, I had to unmute myself. Um, my apologies. Uh, first of all, uh, Chair, I would like to compliment Kim and all the staff uh, there that have worked so hard over the the months on this. To uh, and alongside the councillors, I might say that pushed uh, for projects to be uh, included and for projects not to be left out and. In turn, we have brought a lot of much needed funding to a lot of local communities. And I think this is very much what council and local council is all about, is that we are here to advocate on behalf of our uh, local areas in order to be able to improve them. And I think uh, this funding between the departments and what we're uh, proposing to allocate here and the potential that it has will make a real difference in a lot of our communities. Uh, I suppose as to uh, the membership uh, chair um, that we mentioned here at 2.2.4, um, I had proposed chair this this group to look at the um, at the potential for capital projects and to get them shovel ready. I believe that we can really only do this with as extensive of representation to the DEAs as possible so that we're on the ground in so far as possible. I don't know about the projects in Greencastle or in in Balcu or wherever, you know. So I think I'm proposing, Chair, that we do look at the at the membership and I would propose that instead of uh, trying to morph out the oversight group that we do it the other way around that we create a membership of about 20 uh, to look at this this would be a uh, representation of the of the council membership uh, on a on a basis of proportionality that out of that 20 you're looking at about seven for Sinn Féin and down through the other parties and independents and that we incorporate the oversight uh, group work into that new group because I think it's important that we uh, have the local knowledge otherwise we're not going to be able to pick up those local projects as easily as we would if we have people there that are as locally connected into all of the uh, projects and all of the communities. So I'm proposing that we we change that membership end of it to a, around about 20 there uh, representation uh, of the representative of the council uh, group and strengths. 
and that we have the oversight group uh, for the capital project spends incorporated into that as opposed to the other way around. And just on 3.1 chair, uh, where we say that this, and I appreciate that there was an underspend uh, there this year and that we're able to uh, put the uh, money towards the capital projects. But I think we shouldn't definitively say that this is not going to be able to be done again. I think that I would rather see the wording somewhere in there underspend dependent or or something like that chair that it gives us because this is uh you know going forward probably going to be a very difficult uh period over the next four or five years um and i think we should retain our ability if we can chair dependent on our budgets and all the rest of it uh, and we usually uh i um hasten to add come in with good uh, budget management in the council with underspends. So I think a very, very good use of that underspend would be where we can to put it into projects in the local communities and be able to support them. So that's my uh, proposal, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Councillor Patrick and Kelly. Uh, thanks, Chair, and happy to second uh, Councillor Relly's proposal. Just wanted to be associated with the comments and thank him and all the officials and directors and indeed the councillors who have worked very hard to get these three over the line and um, particularly uh, would like to welcome Greencastle, um, a very hard working club who is in my own DA and a good rural club and deserve uh, the funding. So thanks very much. Okay, next we have Councillor Robert Irvine. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm probably going to pour cold water. I think I've had some of the enthusiasm here. I appreciate at 8.2 the recommendation that we did have a discussion in PR in January. And because those three failed to meet the criteria of central government funding, that this council decided we would try and take the slack up and go forward with it. We did not at that stage envisage, I think as the officers are coming forward here, that there would be um, a saving in revenue spend. And now we are talking about allocating it to further community capital projects. Look, members, we haven't really talked about this. We've just gone through, and I'll reiterate, we've gone through an estimates process. We've gone through a rate setting process. We had a discussion in regard to that about allocating dedicated money into reserves for internal capital projects coming forward. And part of the increase in the rates is to actually put funds into reserves for capital projects that this council will lead on. Here we are having, um, thankfully, a surplus on revenue funding in year. It's not recurrent. Um, and we're talking about allocating it to community grants that are in essence funded by direct um, department funding, but some of them have fallen outside it. We already have an extensive grants program where we provide capital grants funding to uh, community-based groups uh, already. And we've agreed that and we set the budget over the next two years. Here we are on the hoof, running on the hoof, talking about allocating in excess of three quarters of a million in year and looking to create that as a recurrent budget line going forward without having a proper discussion tied back to the budget. We have heard from the director that there is a reserves policy coming forward. Now, I hope, director, that within that reserves policy, there's adequate criteria set down that should there be savings within year by department heads, heads of service, that there will be proper criteria as to show and see how that money should be allocated, rather than bringing it into the chamber and saying we have a pot of X amount, what do you want to do to spend it on? We should actually work through a certain uh, go of criteria. Maybe we should think about having a contingency fund set aside that could be taken into account in the yearly estimates process that can be used where necessary again based on criteria 
for projects such as these coming forward. And when such contingency expended, then we draw a line and we say we have no more money. We have also proposals coming into the chamber that have a direct effect on resources, particularly in regard to human resource input from council staff. And we don't actually know the implication in the chamber when we're making those proposals. So maybe in the reserves policy coming forward, there should be that put down as well, that any proposal being made in the chamber should first of all be crossed off against the reserves policy to ensure and to see what are the cost implications of such before it's fully ratified and implemented by the officers on our behalf. Look, we've had a discussion here about our extensive capital programme. And here we are trying to subvert money off to different types of capital project in the community. And we're going to be faced with extensive extra costs on some of our major capital programmes, particularly our own, in that it could possibly be listed. And we don't know the financial cost of that. And who's going to pick that up? We, the council, stroke the rate pairs is going to do that. We need to be prudent going forward and make sure that we have enough money in reserves to fund the capital programme that we've already decided on, rather than straying into the territory of capital funding in the community that is the proviso of departments. So I'm against the recommendations currently sitting down. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. That's quite a it's quite a lot to take on board what Robert is saying there, but um, I understood we were trying to be ambitious in how we're going to look at capital projects across our communities. You know, we have discussed this at length about trying to encourage communities to come forward with projects, to come up with ideas. You know, I think it's fantastic to have a pot from underspend to utilize it in such a way to invest in our communities. And we should be commending officers for bringing forward such a proposal to the committee tonight. I don't think it's, it's certainly not bad news. Investing in our communities is exactly the type of council we should be. So I thoroughly support the recommendations in front of us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Alex Baird. Thank you very much, Chair. I just wish it was half as articulate as my colleague, Councillor Irvine, who can be succinct and accurate in what he says. But what concerns me about this is we went through a prolonged rate setting process and we came, well, an agreement uh, and a figure was arrived at. Now, during that process, Robert leading us and my party, uh, it was discussed that any savings, whatever they be, in year, instead of being spent and just automatically disposed of, went into reserves. Now, suddenly out of the blue, £1.2 million pounds becomes available. And the questions I've got to ask, where did it come from? When did it become available? Because if this was known, it should have been a consideration within the rate setting process, and we would have been able to have lower rates, I would have thought. Now, 1.2 million, I, I don't know what the, the percentage figure, uh, single percentage figure of a rate increase is, but I'd hazard a guess uh, that 1.2 million probably represents 2%. Now, again, Robert used the phrase and I'd written down before I was going to speak about policy on the hoof. We've changed policy on the hoof of public art where uh, we had a, a, a convention, if not an agreement, that public art would be privately funded and we overturned that. It, it seems just that uh, custom and practice doesn't apply. Uh, the same principle should be here. This money should be going back into reserves. It's just a, 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 the ratepayers uh, who uh, we are finally responsible to, I believe will be aghast that one, the money was found, and two, it's going to be redistributed uh, uh, immediately or well, in, uh, in the plan. So I support my colleague, Councillor Irvine, but I will not support this. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Councillor Hard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I just want to reiterate what Robert said. I mean, 
a revenue, a residue from revenue going into capital. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't see how that can be. And uh, with regard to what he said about supplementing government departments, again, we're going down the line. If the criteria wasn't met within the council, stumps up. Now, while I have sympathy with community groups and so on and so forth, uh, really, we've got to be thinking of our own capital projects as a council and how we're going to finance those without a diverting revenue costs across. So again, I would not be happy with the recommendations as they are, Chair. Okay, Councillor Tommy McGuire. I go, Margaret Kearley. Well, uh, I'm obviously not in agreement with some of the comments made there because, as far as I recollect, the the availability of of this funding was made clear at the estimates evening, uh, which probably went part of the way where some members decided to propose the rate increase of 1.2 percent on our district. The other thing I would consider that uh, these three projects were part of a recollect rate of 14 projects that were discussed at lag meetings, of which I'm not a member, but we were fairly clear that there was 14 shovel ready proposals within the, 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 the lag. These three fell outside the, uh, the COVID recovery small settlement scheme and uh, hence we're in the position now that uh, with this uh, added capital money we have uh, secured prudently from the rates that these three projects are, can now uh, get the funding from ourselves, which as other councillors have said is fundamentally what we are here to do as councillors to enhance uh, the services we provide and enhance the, uh, our communities. And uh, we are all continually talking about our, our rural uh, deficit across our district and uh, Given the geographical spread of these particular projects and their rural nature, I think that will be welcomed by the communities there. Uh, on the issue, then, as Councillor O'Reilly indicated, that uh, the terms of rec reference, or sorry, the the the, uh, the makeup of the group, uh, certainly, I think it should be more rural focused. Uh, uh, it should be enhanced. Uh, the councillors that are living in their communities as. Councillor O'Reilly said he doesn't know much about Greencastle and, and the various other uh, far strung areas in our district. I again would, would concur with that as a town councillor in Inniskillen. I'm not aware of the full impacts in the rural communities, but uh, I, I am uh, been listening here long enough over the last 10 years and, and all the, the rural deficits that I have uh, listened to and I agree with that we as a rural district do not get the proper funding from central government. Uh, through our prudent uh, calculation through our rates, this money has been secured for this purpose, and I welcome it. But uh, I would agree with Councillor O'Reilly, and some consideration needs to be given to the makeup of our uh, oversight group going forward. Gromagada Kerley. Okay, thank you, Councillor Donalo Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I uh, I think there are very uh, genuine issues being raised here. Um, if this has arisen from an underspend in revenue budgets of 1.2 million, uh, I, I have to question why it is that this is just going to rural areas. Uh, we, we have just had sight of statistics now which are showing uh, that there's very heavy uh, deprivation, uh, health impacts, um, severe, like uh, a very large differential existing in regard to deprivation um, and, and it's concentrated in, in the neighborhood renewal areas. I'm wondering why, why whether this fund would be subject to uh, an equality screening for its impact on uh, deprivation. Because um, I think, uh, you know, it's the extent of uh, need at the moment is huge in the community and uh, I'm not totally convinced that the best thing we can be allocating funding to here are um, you know, uh, private or sporting clubs and so on. Um, I think that there are big issues in our, in our neighborhoods around the, you know, many uh, central services in the absence of provision. 
Um, and I, I don't, I just have to question why, uh, if this has arisen from a, a saving on our revenue budgets, it has not been subject to an equality screening process. And in particular, whether there is any allocation or a, a ring fencing of funds for areas uh, in, in uh, you know, um, social need uh, in particular. I, I'm sure some of these are in so areas of social need, but it needs to be uh, screened in, a, in an open manner. I think that is, that's what I would be saying. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to let Kim sum up here and then we're going to go because it's obviously there's dissent to this, so we're going to go to a vote. Um, so, Kim, can sum up? Okay, if I could just clarify in terms of Council Coffee's comments, the, the fund, we're proposing a capital fund, but it's not just ring fenced for rural areas. The three projects identified are rural areas, and we were specifically asked to look at opportunities to fund those because they weren't eligible. For the small settlements programme, however, there will remain a £750,000 allocation from the fund, which would then be open to applications from across the district for capital projects, and we will bring the criteria through to the April meeting of the committee once the decision is taken whether to proceed with the fund or, or not. So in terms of, of next steps, we have a proposal from Councillor McPhillip, seconded by Councillor Feely for the recommendations, which would include recommendation four in terms of the oversight group being expanded. We have a separate proposal from Councillor O'Reilly, seconded by Councillor Kelly, that that the recommendation four would be amended to increase, sorry, to establish a working group which would subsume the oversight group and would have a membership of 20 members. Could I just comment before we, we move uh, to consider any of those that we would need to identify um, if members wish to, by agreement, um, identify the breakdown of that 20 uh, membership working, 20 member working group in terms of, of representation across the groups. And if that um, isn't isn't done by agreement, then the DeHunt allocations would um, come into play. So just to take members' views on that. Okay, we'll go firstly to the uh, recommendations that have been proposed and seconded. Councillor Curry. Well, it was just to comment on the question Kim just asked um, before we go to that, I think. Um, just there was a question around the membership, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Collier, um, Councillor O'Reilly proposed earlier um, to maybe consider a 20-member group that would give, give good coverage across the district and maybe have the breakdown then representative of, of um, party strength and independence. So, and I think he suggested the number uh, seven for Sinn Féin members on that group. And I think that it would follow then that you would have five UUP, three DUP, three SDLP, and two independent single parties. And I think that adds up to 20. Chair, Gurmagat. Okay, well, we're going, first of all, I'll bring that proposal in after, but we're going, firstly, to, we're going to take them separately. So I'm going to the vote on the recommendations. Um. Chair, just can I clarify? Uh, sorry, Victor, for butting in, but um, I don't know whether you can hear me, but I can't hear you. But if you can hear me, Chair, uh, just to clarify, uh, I would suspect that Councillor Feely uh, will incorporate uh, Councillor O'Reilly's proposal into his. Uh, uh, before we go to the vote on that, maybe that should be clarified. That's Councillor McPhillips' proposal seconded by Councillor Feely. Yes, yes, sorry, Councillor McPhillips. If Councillor McPhillips was happy enough to incorporate that, I think that would maybe solve the, the okay. because I think they're overlapping, maybe. Okay. Councillor O'Reilly, you're happy enough that that's uh, incorporated in to your proposal? Yes, Chair. Okay. Yeah, happy enough. What? 
Chair, can I request a recorded vote, please? Chair, your mic's not on. We don't hear anything from you on line. There's some people. There's some people very glad that that's happening, Thomas. To be honest with you, I didn't hear you uh, now, I, Victor. Can I confirm what we're actually voting on here? Uh, we're voting on the recommendations plus Councillor O'Reilly's proposal, where we enhance the an oversight group uh, up to twenty. Um, up to 20 people uh, from across the district, uh, breaking it down. Uh, well, it hasn't been hit on yet, but seven members of Sinn Féin. Can I just uh, just check? I, I don't think we can agree uh, to uh, a, a specific number unless there is unanimity. Otherwise, we have to go to a Dehaunt process. Okay, yeah. We're, we're seeking it, but... I take it everybody online has voted now. Uh, can we, well, can we set it up in the chamber? Chair, I, uh, Alec here, I haven't been able to vote. Um, uh, all that talking was going on. I was listening to it and then the vote closed. Okay. Same here, Chair. What, 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 Sorry, Chair, the same here as well. What, we, what here, we'll yeah. do, what we'll do, please settle down, what we'll do, we will cancel the two votes and we will start them again afresh because there was too much talking when they should have been listening. Um, so we will start off again um, with a new vote, both in the chamber and online. Okay, the vote is now up. Okay, the for the recommendations and the extra proposal, there's 19 for, 12 against. And because there has been dissent on that, uh, we have to go to the hunt to decide the, the makeup of the, of the committee. Chair, in terms of the DeHunt allocations, then we would start at position 55 and run for 20 positions. And that would give us a breakdown of eight Sinn Féin, five UUP, three DUP, two SDLP, and two independents being uh, Councillor Keenan and Councillor Swift. 
Okay. Okay, that's been noted. Uh, that is now proposed and passed. Um, we're going to move on now. Remember, we are at after quarter verse nine, and we're now moving on to the community, community and well-being reports. And we're over to John, and the first one is to consider report on the Irish language delivery plan twenty two twenty three paper G. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Irish delivery or the Irish language delivery plan is included at Appendix One. It, it was discussed at the All Councillor Irish language briefing session in, in February of, of this year, uh, and simply chair its uh, approval for, for the delivery plan itself. Thank you, Chair. Okay, first up we have Councillor McAleer. Yeah, Chair, mindful of the time, I'm happy enough to propose noting. I think it's a, a very promising project and uh, I'd like to commend the team on, on bringing it this far. Um, I'm particularly personally looking forward to the, the Scale to Modular Lonely event and also around that, but happy enough to, to propose the note. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Sean Clark. Chair, I want to second the report. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And then we have Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Gormaga de Cahirli is in talk show at Gail Kinchu, because we're going to talk to Miguel at Tom and Fear of Rodul Pakiak, the Yenev Lesh and Tursh. Um, just, uh, I'll just reiterate the comments that have been there. Happy to support the delivery plan. I do think it's excellent and great timing as we're into Shocked in the Gaelic now. Gormaga. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I've heard it. Uh, the recommendation proposed in second. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. We'll move on. Next is 6.2. Is to consider a report on fair funding for organisations in the voluntary and community sector. Thank you, Chair. Yes, in, in December, uh, the Minister for Communities announced a fair funding approach uh, to support the voluntary and, and community sector um, and, and, and for funding for posts directly related to the Department for Communities. Uh, we have got an offer or further offer. We were received funding in December of 21, but we've got a further offer uh, in February of 22 for, for posts in the community and voluntary sector that are funded through the community support program, and namely those within our district related to community advice for MANA and OMA Independent Ad Ad Advice Service. It, it's proposed, and, the, and these proposals come from the Department for Communities uh, as to what is funded in relation to uplift of salaries of those personnel that are that are employed in those two organisations. There are a number of elements to it. One is an uplift uh, to allow for the payment of the real living wage of uh, nine ninety per hour. The the second element relates to a two percent consolidated uplift uh, for all of those staff. Um, and this is not something that we're planning to, to apply because we already have a 2% uh, uplift as part of the contractual arrangement with the, with the two organisations. Uh, the third element of it is a 7% non-consolidated uplift, uh, which would be again a non-recurring uh, payment uh, to the staff or, uh, in the two organisations, which is proposed by DFC. And uh, associated with that is the employer pension contributions and indeed the employer national insurance uh, contributions. Uh, so, Chair, it's uh, recommended that the Council approves the additional allocation of funding for the Community Advice for MANA and OMA Independent Advice Services to address the fair funding within each organisation. Okay, you, thank you. First up with Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Again, happy to propose and open the recommendations contained within like the, the independent advice services offered by the, the two organisations. Hugely important, and obviously, with all that's going on at the moment, even more so. Could I just, just before proposing the note, um, just in relation to, as, as John said there, the 2% the consolidated uplift, um, there's no provision to permit that on top of what we currently offer. Is that right? That's capped. Um, we wouldn't have the ability to offer that on top of what's already unoffered and already agreed by council. 
Chair, we, we, we could we could allow it, except it just would be coming out of our funds because we already have a, a contractual obligation in re, in relation to that. So it would it would be a cost to the council rather than directly funded from DFC. And you've got to remember that this would be a recurring cost. So you would be talking about adding on four percent, and that would be an ongoing process. You know, four percent, and then the two percent of the four percent next year. So it would be an ongoing cost uh, recurring in thereafter. Okay, next we have Councillor Dehan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, John, too, for your report. And I think this is a good news story. Um, I want to use this opportunity to pay tribute to our advice services. And as Councillor McAleer has said, their services are needed now more than ever. And I think it is appropriate uh, that uh, those dedicated workers uh, receive fair recompense for their work and that they receive uh, these uplifts uh, and uh, the, the living wage. I do think it's fair. I think it's a great initiative from the Department of Communities and uh, I'm happy to second the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Patrick Weathers. Yeah, thank you. I just want to uh, echo what was said before there and um, welcome this funding for the Home Management Advice Services and the uh, Community Advice Romana. I think the uplift for the staff um, and their wages is much deserved for the work they're doing at this time, um, in particular with the cost of living crisis we're meeting. Um, obviously, the funding coming from the Communities Minister, Deidre Hargey, is a mitigation against the welfare reforms that were introduced by the, the Tories in London. So um, I think it's going to be much welcomed and it'll certainly support and help people um, at this critical time. Some of the most vulnerable in society who uh, try to access a service to overcome the barriers that have been in place to try and stop them from being able to uh, access the support. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, next we have Councillor Paul Blake. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It was only just to declare an interest as sitting on the management committee of the Community Advice for Mana. So that was all, Chair. Okay. And um, finally, Councillor Barry McElduff. Again, Chair, just to declare an interest as a board member of OMA Independent Advice Services. Okay. Uh, thank you, Thompson's doing the same there. Councillor Thompson, you're declaring yeah, an like, interest. Well. Likewise, Chair, uh, OMA Independent Advice Services. Thank you. Councillor. Tommy McGuire. Carly, likewise, to declare an interest in the Skilling branch. Thank you. Councillor Garrity. Uh, same, Chair. Keep yourself bright. OMA Independent Advice Services. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You've heard it proposed and seconded. Uh, that that's accepted. Everybody happy with that? Okay. We will move on now to item 6.3 which is to consider the report on the implications of potential listing of the Ardoan Theatre paper I. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this, this was mentioned, I think, at our council meeting with the correspondence uh, from HED was brought forward and uh, it was said that a report would be brought through to this meeting on the implications of it. Um, the survey was carried out, um, in the second survey in January 22, and we were uh, notified in, in February of the intention of HED to proceed with listing of, of the building. Um, the document which uh, the which accompanies the the letter in in respect of the survey, we we don't really have any issues with it. Uh, in in respect of the the facts that are included in it, and there's nothing we can really object to in in that sense. Um, there are a number of issues in in relation to the the impact of that, uh, especially as we are proposing to redevelop the the Ardoan Theatre. Um, the extent, there are issues in relation to the extent of of, of the listing and, and uh, listing if it is if it does come to pass includes all of, all of the buildings and indeed any structures within the cartilage of the building which may not even be fixed to the building itself. I suppose more importantly is the impact on 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 the the need for listed building consent, uh, especially in the fact that we are planning to redevelop the the Ardoan. Uh, as it would affect maybe the character of the building as a special architectural or, or historical interest, it would require uh, listed building consent. Um, and, and that brings with it 
various implications with regard to cost uh, and indeed the ability to do some of the things that maybe we had planned, although there are no definitive detailed plans as, as to the nature of the work. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, the way to in, at best be the need for an architectural uh, conservationist uh, during the lifetime of the project and so on, which, which will add additional cost uh, to, to the project itself. Um, just in, in, in relation to the, the, the building and, and what the impact on it also, uh, when we were in recognition of this, when we were going out to tender for the integrated design consultancy team for the Ardoan, we had just become aware of the intention of HED to, uh, or at least to carry out the survey or that they were undertaking the survey and we had a fair idea that, that it, they were going down the road of listing. So we included in, in the tender of that design uh, the appointment of a design team to reflect the possibility that it would be uh, that it would be listed, and, and therefore the cost implications of that, uh, you know, are, are just a, the tender for that is due to close, and we, we should be aware of that, uh, you know, pretty soon as the impact of it at, at a cost stage for the design at least. Um, the, the you know it, it may impact on on the council's aspirations, especially in in you know a user centered you know environmentally sustainable accessible uh, building um, listing could have an impact but uh, what, I, what i can say is that you know we will work with HED in respect of this in respect of the development itself in order to make sure that all the all the requirements of listing should have come to pass and indeed of the development are, are, are totally met um, like I said, it's not possible to quantify the financial implications of it at this time, but we will bring a report through when those when those are further known. So therefore, Chair, it's it's um, recommended that the Council notes the report, but also that we respond to HED regarding the potential listing of the Ardoan accepting the accuracy of, of the survey and stating that it considers the second survey to be accurate. Uh, it has no comment on the architectural and historical importance of the building beyond that detailed in the survey itself. That the timing of the listing process initiated by HED is unfortunate, and I think that is the case with regard to our council because of the timing of the development, um, and and that is both communication with the council in in that sense has been poor with us. Um, it's also recommended that the council is committed to pursuing good practice in conservation architecture as well as design excellence, and has been reflected in the procurement process for an integrated consultants team, and we'll be highlighting that in in the return to HED. Also, in that return, we'll be talking, we'll be saying that the council is committed to environmental sustainability and enhanced accessibility, and hopes to work with HED in attaining these the aspirations in the context of the listed building. And finally, that the council has an ambitious timetable for redevelopment. Uh, of their doing and, and seeks that undertaking that there will be no delays caused by HED as a result of, of a possible listing process. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. First up, we have Councillor Howard Thornton. Hey, thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I spoke a little bit of the Council meeting. It is, as John said, very disappointing that it's taken two years between the two uh, surveys and uh, to drop this in at this time is extremely disappointing. I have no doubt that it's going to cause time delays, it's going to cause extra costs, and uh, whether we can get our nearly uh, zero energy building or whatever, and of course the access uh, which we were trying to build in and our objectives. So very disappointing, but I propose the uh, response as outlined by John and hope that if it is listed, that HE Day do not cause additional problems along the line to us of achieving our objectives. Uh, and hopefully the Lakeland Forum will not be part of our list listing process shortly as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Robert Irving. Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, it is disappointing that it's taken so long, but they're a statutory body and they are in charge of built heritage. So I think it's a case of suck it and see and see where we go. Again, it's going to have a knock-on effect. It's no use hiding behind the, the woods. It is. The question I would ask is, it talks about building, but it, are they talking about both buildings, the Victorian and the um, Tracy Malarkey? Yep. In its entirety? And what about the environs that actually add, could possibly add to the um, locality of the place? 
I'm not sure whether they, they, they indicate there, I think, under their, their reference, but... Chair, I suppose listing status is, is included there at 2.3, and I, I just can't confirm that it is both elements of the building itself, um, and it is in relation to the structure alone. So I suppose if you're talking about the environments around it, you know, it doesn't refer it doesn't refer to that element, but just to the building itself. It doesn't currently, because it hasn't been listing. That's the intention. Will yes. they actually come out with the final listing? It may actually. So. Could we could we bottom that out at, at some stage because that's going to have a direct effect because we were talking about i think in the the original outline proposals that a certain amount of redesign with regard to parking access and landscaping you know around the area could be affected and if, if you are looking at it uh, from a hed um, conservation point of view it, it's not just the building i would presume it's the setting of the building, and the setting actually would partially contribute to the overall aspect. So I think we need to get that uh, fully quantified and bottomed out. But again, we're into additional cost and possibly into additional time, and it's going to restrict what we can actually do then with the fabric of the building in its entirety. So it's unfortunate, but uh, we're stuck with it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Paul Blake. Uh, thanks, Chair. Also sharing the disappointment uh, that I felt already by Councillor Irvine and Thornton on it, because it is very disappointing, this, especially the time frame on it and the timing when we had such a bold uh, vision for the Ardoan Theatre, because it very much is an asset for, for, the, for the town and for the district. Um, I could understand it very much for the old Victorian part of the building, but I'm still a wee bit unsure as to whether the, the, the newer part where the auditorium and the rest of them is could be impacted by it. I, I see it listed in the report that it is, but I'd also see if there could be more clarity could be provided on why the building as a whole is, is included in this thing. And also there, as Councillor Irvine said, is looking for more more clarity definitely on the overall thing with regard to the setting on it too and uh, also john is there any right of appeal on this because i think it will definitely impact especially on our costs but also on our on our vision for the project that we want to create there on that site chair just in relation to the new part of the building the reason why it has actually been included is because it it, it was developed by a renowned architect uh, and as was his designs are such that they, they do actually come in on their special architectural interest uh, and therefore it is very much part of the of the design process itself um just uh, so it, it is it is both both parts of the building is there a right of appeal no there isn't what what the HED decide uh, then I suppose it's in our, our best approach is to to try and work as best as we can with HED in, in delivery of, of our plans for the Ardoan in, in relation to it, if it decides to to, uh, to list the building. Councillor McGuire. Uh, Gunnar Margaret Kerley, and thanks for that clarification there, John, and, and, and uh, that's actually our worst fears have been realised because I was coming in to, 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 to make the same question as other county councillors, is it the old, uh, older building or is it the, the theatre itself? Uh, given away my age, I, I actually was in council when our door was opened and uh, I would have thought, uh, the thought was in my head to say, why did they not list the old house before the theatre was built if it was of such historical significance? But now that you've outlined that it's actually the architectural design of the theatre itself that is now within the, the remit of the listing and I would suggest it is probably the theatre the glass fronted theatre that is actually of more significance to the listing than the old Victorian building and that unfortunately is the reality of the position we're in. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I think we all have to realise at this position uh, or at this moment that our plans as we've already looked at and the amount of money we've already spent in in some of the scoping work may have been wasted. I honestly think that if this goes ahead, that the overall costs and the limitations they're going to put 
we were talking about triple glazing, et cetera, for heat retention. I would suggest that that glass front is probably the most historical significant thing now uh, of the architecture of the new theatre. So uh, I wouldn't be very optimistic, and it's unfortunate given that we had already done this uh, investigative work and we're looking forward to some investment in it, and plans were going uh, uh, along fairly well. So it's unfortunate, but uh, as you say, we have no right to... Uh, to, to redress if they do decide to list it, but I, I think the investigation then into the overall cost would need to be carried out immediately if that happens, John, because I think it could scupper our plans that we've already discussed, unfortunately. Chair Gurmagat. Yes, can, Chair, can I just say that we will keep Council abreast as to the implications of this from a financial point of view as, as we progress through the process. Councillor Swift. Or Magath Kahir, look, and uh, I have a, a, a higher feeling than just disappointment on this. I'm pretty outraged and I object to HED coming in at this very late stage. Um, uh, and again, it has been stated in our recommendation about the communication has been very poor and it's just not acceptable. And I do object and, and there is no right to appeal their decision. And, and it is very questionable why at this late stage and that's notwithstanding the brilliance of the Ardoans foresight a way back so many years ago and the beauty of it as it stands. But we have very ambitious plans to put forward. And I would really despair at the thought of any of those wonderful plans being scuppered, future proofed and everything else and would undoubtedly be brilliant. And it is totally and blatantly unfair that a statutory department now is interfering with our project. It's just not good enough. And furthermore, there is miscommunication out there as well, that it is we, the council, who is intending to list the Ardoan and not a statutory body. So, you know, that's unfortunate too. But uh, I thank John for the report. And I know you're all working well and have done and have no other objections in much of the content of the report. But I object uh, to this interference. Okay, there's no more speakers indicating. Well, can I get somebody to second the the, the recommendations, please? Uh, they were proposed by Councillor Thornton. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Tommy Maguire, thank you. Okay, next we, next we move on to 6.4 which is to consider the report of the Director of Community and Wellbeing, Paper J. Thank you, Chair. There, there are four elements to the report, Chair. Uh, one is to seek approval for the Stillbert Neonatal Charity, which is known as SANS, and I think there is a SANS group already exists in OMA, uh, to use the Fermanagh Lakeland Forum as a host location for four awareness sessions, and indeed maybe thereafter for them to set up a group and to, to meet on a regular basis uh, using football as, 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 the, as the meeting point. Uh, to seek approval for illumination of council buildings on the 11th of March to mark the European Day of Remembrance for Victims of, Tour of Terrorism. Uh, to note the events to, to mark the 40th anniversary of the opening of Oma Leisure Complex and, and to seek approval for 40 pence fitness classes uh, just to, to mark that event and to note the reopening of all leisure centre facilities and programmes following the easing of COVID restrictions. Um, Chair, the, the 2.1 deals with uh, the SANS awareness sessions um, you know, and I, I think it's a positive uh, contribution to, to, to our district again. Uh, the second one is the illumination of the council buildings on the 11th of March to, to mark the European Day of Remembrance. The 40th anniversary of Oma Leisure Complex. Uh, Oma Leisure Complex first opened on the 18th of March 1982. And it's proposed that a series of family and fitness focused events uh, are held at Oma Leisure Complex on Saturday the 26th of March. And it's planned to run special offers at 40 pence, including fitness classes, access to the fitness suite, swims, children bouncy castle, just to have a family fun day effectively at Oma, at Oma Leisure Complex. Uh, and it'll also coincide with the launching of the family membership offer uh, at all four leisure centres, which was previously approved by, by members. Uh, the, the fourth element is, is just for information purposes on the reopening of, of the leisure uh, centres uh, across the district uh, for the reopen for full provision from the, the 7th of March. 
uh, completing the phase return of leisure services. Uh, I'll draw members' attention to the final paragraph uh, there about you know the the messaging and the reopening is is emphasising caution, still the need for for continued personal responsibility and and to respect all other users and and indeed staff in the facility, yeah, and that's requiring face masks that are still required within the facilities. Um, uh, the need for social distancing is still encouraged. Uh, and also that it may uh, require, as COVID continues to evolve, that our operational requirements may change at short notice. Uh, therefore, Chair, the, the recommendation is the Council approves the use of the synthetic pitch at Fermanagh Lakeland Forum Bay Sands for four awareness sessions, uh, that it approves the elimination of Council buildings on the 11th of March to mark the European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Terrorism, to note the, the 40th anniversary activities at Dome Leisure Complex planned for the 26th of March and, and the special offer sessions at 40 pence and notes the cautious reopening of leisure centres and programmes following the easing of, of COVID restrictions. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. First up, we have Councillor Josephine Deham. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd like to thank John for his report. Um, and I'm happy to propose all the recommendations, Chair. I just want to make particular note of the work of SANS, the Stillbirth and Neonatal uh, Death Society. I think they do excellent work uh, helping grieving parents and anything that this council can do to support their work, I'm really supportive of it. Um, in relation to Oma Leisure Complex, I can hardly believe that it is 40 years since it was opened. Since then, of course, it has been extensively refurbished and uh, um, it is well used by our community. In relation uh, to uh, the reopening of all our facilities, well, I do uh, welcome that chair and hopefully it will contribute to a sense of normality within our, within our district. However, I want to sound a, a very significant um, note of caution. Uh, I think that uh, everyone knows that COVID has not gone away and that it is everyone's personal responsibility uh, to uh, behave responsibly and to take all precautions necessary uh, to uh, prevent um, uh, spread of infection within our community because our health services are, are already under severe pressure and we certainly uh, want to keep our community safe and to ensure that our health services can cope uh, as best they can during a very difficult period. So happy to propose recommendations, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Matthew Bell. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I also want to thank John for this report. Um, this is for um, uh, very different recommendations but uh, all the same for um, excellent recommendations and I'm happy enough to second them all as well. Um, in relation to um, illuminating the, the, the buildings for European, um, for victims of uh, terror, uh, uh, in relation to item two anyway, um, I think we here in Northern Ireland um, know very well the effects of terrorism, so it's great to see we're joining our European um, allies in marking that. Um, in relation to item three, I, I think this is an excellent initiative. Um, I think it will encourage lots of people to uh, go to Home Leisure Centre, which does offer fantastic facilities. And hopefully we'll get a few more people come back and just generally promote health for Noma. And then um, lastly, um, in relation to item four, Councillor Dean was absolutely right. Um, we do need to be careful and continue good practice for COVID uh, or to prevent COVID, sorry. But um, I, I, I think it's also worth stressing positivity. We, we, I think it is a sign we're coming out of this pandemic and um, perhaps a good time to reflect on all the hard work people put into the community and all the sacrifices many people made as we start to get back to normal. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Next, we have Councillor Barry McElduff. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just to zone in on item Two, three, the 40th anniversary of Oma Leisure Centre, Oma Leisure Complex, as it has become more known more recently. Just want to commend the council and the management team and the manager, the current and past managers and staff over those four decades, because as the note says, it really is at the heart of the Oma and 
rural community in our area and uh, it has made a brilliant contribution to everybody's overall health and well-being and i like the 40p initiative you know people will avail of that and enjoy it 40 pence for this and 40 pence for that on the day and uh, going to coincide with the launch of the family membership so all's positive there just in relation to health and well-being i think maybe at the, a future meeting of this committee it would be good to hear about the role and operation of our health and well-being program we have health and well-being officers in place now and some of us have yet to meet them and hear what to do at first hand so that we can uh, work with our local communities to make optimum use of the resource that they are so uh, i look forward to that as well in the future chair thank you okay thank you next we have councillor earl thompson thank you very much chair uh, well like my uh, fellow town councillors i i very much welcome uh all parts of the recommendation, as, as, as Councillor Bell has said, four very different pieces of uh, recommendation there, but I'm happy to support them all. Just with regard to number three, obviously it brings me back to my young day, Chair, uh, go, go into the then Oma Leisure Centre, uh, when I was a lot, a lot younger than I am now, and uh, it's hard to believe the 40 pence uh, uh, offer the sessions for a 40 pence but uh through through those years it was uh it was good that we had the foresight to do a, a lot of work it needed to be done to all my leisure centers as it was then uh and we were part of the i and others were part of the refurbishment working group uh with the what is now Oma leisure complex and it was very much to be welcomed at the time, and the community has been in, in great support of that. Just with regard to the fourth part of the recommendation, obviously, Councillor Bell touched on it as well. Uh, I think it's a lot to do with common sense, John, and it has to do with positivity as well. So let's let's be positive as we move forward. Happy to support the recommendations as listed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. And a lot of what I was going to say has already been covered. But in relation to point three of the recommendations, I think it's an excellent idea to mark the 40th anniversary, to have the 40 P sessions for people to come in and, you know, try out the facilities again. Maybe people that haven't, you know, visited the leisure centre even before the pandemic, just as an opportunity for the leisure complex to showcase what they can do and what they can offer to the Oma area and the surrounding rural areas, so it's definitely to be welcomed. And I'm not sure if Councillor McAdoff is making a proposal about the a report coming back about the well-being officers. I can certainly say in our area we've had good engagement with our well-being officer, and they're doing excellent work in our area. But I'd welcome the opportunity to hear what others are doing. Maybe we can learn from other areas. That'll be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, we have Councillor Anthony Feely. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Kim, for that. And I just want to come in on, on 2.1 there, the SANS Awareness Sessions, and I think it's a very good initiative and fair play to them fellas for starting that up. I think one, and one of them guys contacted me that was starting up that football team, and we, he contacted other councillors as well. And it's great to see, good to see men getting out to talk about issues like that, which as everybody knows, not that good at talking about stuff like that. And it's very emotional thing to happen in any family. But they're looking for um, some kind of support, and I would encourage the council to give them as much support as we can and for officers to explore ways we could help them out as, as uh, they're looking for the use of the pitch maybe give them a discount or stuff like that there just give them as much help as we can for i think it's a good initiative thanks kim thank you uh okay you've heard the uh, report uh proposed and seconded is everybody happy with that thank you okay we're moving on now as i said at the start of the meeting we're one to omit uh, items seven and eight at this stage and move to correspondence and we are going to Oh, 
9.9, yeah, we're not. 9.1, we're doing 9.2, 9.21. Okay, 9.1 is considered a correspondence dated the 15th of February from the blue flag regarding purple flag award ceremony 22. Yes, th thank you, Chair. Yes, um, Chair, members may be aware that uh, OMA uh, again receives the purple flag and, and the award ceremony is um, at Canterbury uh, Cathedral Lodge on the, the 24th of March. Uh, we have received two free dinner tickets um, uh, to attend the event. Uh, it would be normal that uh, the chair and an officer would 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 attend such event, uh, so th this just up for members um, to decide if, if if that's the approach they would take. Um, just let you know that the the purple flag for Enniskillen, uh, the assessment is taking place in April of of this year. So we hope to have a, have another ceremony for for Enniskillen in in the summertime. Thank you, chair. Okay, first up we starting. So a bit of an echo, is that me, Chair? Yes? Sorry, Councillor Gardy, yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, John. Um, listen, uh, I, I will happily go with the view of the members, but I know in previous experience I was lucky enough to visit this event, and I think it shows our interest in our two major towns uh, and, and the purple st uh, status as well. So. I'm not sure the availability of the chair for this event, um, John, but if it was the members' wishes, I think it should be attended and, and show the support um, that we give to this recognition. Uh, and special congratulations to Oman, hopefully Anna Skillen and follow suit. And I propose that the chair and an officer would attend if it suits our diary. That would be my proposal, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, next we have Councillor Herd Thornton. Chair, I would second uh, Councillor Gardy's proposal there. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, John, for that. Uh, just with regard to Councillor Gardy's proposal, seconded by Councillor Thornton, I'm not actually available on the 24th, for I have a number of engagements that I've already committed to. However, uh, I, I do believe that this council should be represented by, by an officer and if possible, maybe maybe the the vice chair would be able to attend. Okay, we we'll go. To, we'll go to the vice chair in a second. Um, before we go to the vice chair, I'll take in Councillor McAleer. Thanks, chair. Um, yeah, it's great that we're getting the award, but I note that the the email or the communication says that the. We get two complimentary tickets for the dinner, <coughs> but it notes that it's been held at the Canterbury Cathedral Lodge in Canterbury, and I'm wondering just what the additional costs will be and who will be footing the bill for that. I um, just wouldn't like to make a decision uh, based solely on two free dinner tickets without taking in the associated costs around that. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the, the council will pick up the tab for travel costs associated with it. And, in and indeed for accommodation or whatever if we required at the time. Okay, uh, Councillor McCaffrey. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, John, just for that explanation. Um, uh, well, cer certainly I'm happy to attend in the absence of the Chair in my capacity as Vice Chair of the Council. Um, I believe that it would be important that there would be some kinds of representation, um, especially as this this award is something you know. Um, it, it helps it helps our nighttime econ economy in the sense that we know we have this accreditation, this award. Um, you know, it it um, shows that our district is safe, and the people can um, socialise freely within within our district as well. So, I, I do believe it's an important award um, to have. So. Uh, I, I would be happy to attend uh, the event. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going back to Councillor Gardy. Do you want to... Chair, just to... briefly to amend, um, and thanks, Chris, for clarifying and Earl, their availability, and if it just for uh, completeness, um, I propose then that Chris goes in the absence of Earl um, to the event to represent the Council. Thank you. If, if that's oh. the wishes of the members, thank you. Okay, Councillor Thornton, are you happy enough to second that? Very happy to second that, Chair. 
Okay. Uh, well, you've heard it uh, proposed and seconded that the vice chair, along with an officer, uh, attends this event. Is everybody happy with that? Chair, I, w I wouldn't be happy to support that, just given the lack of finances around it. So not at this stage, yeah. thank you. Me neither, Victor, please. I myself, Chair. So three dissenters. Okay, that's passed. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on now to uh, next item is 9.2. Consider email correspondence dated the 3rd of March 22 from Tourism NA regarding Northern Ireland Hotels Vibration Business Outlook Seminar on the 15th of March in the Le Mans Hotel. Chair, this is uh, information about a seminar, as you've outlined, on the 15th of March. It's a morning seminar from 9.15 to 2 p.m. And it's an industry-focused event which will focus on customer sentiment, travel trends and intelligence from uh, a review of, of the Republic of Ireland market and discussion on how to maximise staycation business. Tickets are £40 plus VAT for uh, Hotel Federation members, of which we're, we are a member. Okay. Uh, there's nobody indicating um, do you want to propose to note that at this stage or is there anybody any interest in going um, Councillor Thornton Councillor McAleer I use a proposed and second to note that proposed to note Chair happy enough to second the noting Chair okay thank you Okay, we're going to go at this stage with a reason for doing this. We're going to go on at this stage to matters arising. Uh, so, first of all, matters arising uh, from our meeting on the 8th of February uh, 22 and page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. Page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, page fourteen. John. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Just. Uh, at 4.1 of the agenda, Chair, there is uh, a response in, in from uh, the Minister for fi Finance in, in relation to affording a scheme for all school children to receive a, a free school meal. Um, he refers uh, the issue uh, as previous to the Education Minister um, to bring forward proposals um, then and be considered by, by a future executive. Thank you, Chair. Okay, four stop. Is Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, in relation to the correspondence, uh, we're seeing a pattern here just of, of disappointing uh, responses. Um, the the not my department excuse uh, being ruled out again. Um, it, 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 it's, well, the response speaks for itself. Um, the Minister has no interest in, in affording uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, or working with the department or saying to take any proactive action in relation to the issue that the council's raised with them. So less than impressed with that. In relation to the issue around free school meals, I'd like to raise a further proposal because I've been contacted by a number of parents in the OMA area who have explained their concern in relation to uh, children actually getting the school meals at their schools. And this is, I suppose, particularly referring to um, post-primary schools in the OMA area, where uh, I've had a number of complaints in relation to children not getting uh, not getting a meal because they're maybe whatever part of the building they're in, by the time they get released from class and out to the canteen, there's nothing left. Or a, a secondary complaint being that um, they're, they're given an allowance for a meal, and I think the, the Education Authority previously allows the previously informed us that uh, people weren't being given a monetary value, they were being given an entitlement to a nutritious school meal.
but we're being advised by some schools that they're actually being given a monetary value and therefore they're not necessarily able to afford a full what's been described as a full nutritious school dinner so i would like the council actually to make representation to the schools in the oma area that's the the post primary schools in the oma area just really to get confirmation in relation to those claims that are coming in from from a number of concerned parents that have contacted me and i'm sure i'm not the only person that's received these complaints and these these queries because you know this is a matter of huge concern if our young people aren't receiving what they're entitled to in terms of that food nutritious school dinner and and that which the the a has previously advised us they are entitled to and they are in receipt of then that's a matter of huge concern for this district council so i would make a proposal that we follow up follow up with the local schools again it's the only area I've been contacted about. If if other members have been informed about other areas, I'm happy to widen that out. But that would be my proposal, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we go any further, can I have a proposal and seconder, please, to extend the meeting by half an hour? Proposed by Councillor Feely, seconded by Councillor Curry. Uh, okay, next we are on to Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm happy to start off with by seconding uh, the proposal, and I, I, I assume I, I think he said uh, uh, Emmett there had proposed the, to note, but uh, if if not, I propose to note or second whichever. Um, the 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 uh, the issue that Emmett's raised, as far as I gather, is indeed um, quite a uh, a widespread one and has been for some while. Um, although there is a notion, notional value uh, attributed to a free school meal, uh, it is also uh, often represented in terms of a value, and the value does not de therefore translate into uh, what you might anticipate. So I, I think perhaps we may need to widen it out, but certainly I'm, I'm happy to support it in relation to the schools he's identified, but I think we'll be back on this one. The, the other issue really is around the free school meals itself, and I, I think it just has to be highlighted that about half, this, uh, you know, approximately half children receive free school meals. The cost of providing a free school meal is actually not that great because basically it's the food, uh, additional food that's been required. Uh, and as well as that, it would actually save money in terms of all the bureaucracy associated with determining who is eligible, who is not eligible, all that cost would be saved. And at the same time, you would have a huge impact in terms of improving uh, the, you know, the, the life chances of young people uh, and uh, the, the efficiencies that you would gain from providing that are substantial. So I, I, I just, I do note that the, the minister leaves the door open. So we'll have to look for what the education minister brings forward. Uh, it is not beyond the ken of uh, uh, Stormont to be able to do this. Local councils in England are doing it. And at the moment, the very people who are not eligible is basically people who are working uh, and in work who are uh, working poor, who both, if you have both parents in the family working, you cannot claim, uh, you cannot claim free school meals for your children. It doesn't matter how low your income is effectively, because it's just over that threshold. So what we're saying here is that everyone should have a right to that, uh, all children, and that isn't a huge thing. And, and uh, the final point I'll make is that uh, these uh, kitchens in, in schools could be opened in the evenings to actually provide social kitchens to benefit people who are currently heating or, or eating. And that's the choice they're facing. At least they would get some hot food. So this is actually sort of measure that could make a transformative uh, difference to the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Next, we have Councillor Swift. For maggots, uh, here, look, and just uh, sticking with this point on, of this particular uh, response back from the finance minister, I too was contacted by a few people on this issue of concern and the report that was in local papers last week, and they have a demand and a call for action as being fundamental and necessary for them. Uh, so I want to contact the Minister for Education on this as advised in this letter and therefore and thereafter copy all a TEO into the correspondence reiterating the demand for action. The free school meals is such a massive help to all families and uh, free school meals for one and all leads to an end to the class distinction and indeed an end to stigma attached to obtaining FSM by providing parity of esteem. 
The free school meals uh, definitely helps towards providing a nutritionist and indeed the prevention of health problems later in life. So as we all know, always early intervention and the understanding of the importance of a hot balanced meal leads well into investing in our children's future generations for sure, understanding that a balanced meal every day is appropriate for health and well-being. But the big issues facing us at the moment of rising food prices ultimately translates into financially constrained parents may have to opt for cheaper and unhealthy options and cheaper alternatives, which as we know are full of sugar and salt, which of course lends to some unhealthy outcomes. So I would be suggesting strongly that the free school meals should be applied to one and all. And thereafter, people have the choice on whether they want to sustain their own food management. But once and for all, make the targeting social need that we've been talking about much of this meeting in our rural deprivation area prevail and make all the buzz phrases that we'll be talking about something genuinely worth digesting. Garmagat. OK, uh, next we have Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Gormagut, Carly, and I'm happy to uh, speak on this issue. Um, to be honest, this response from the Minister of Finance was what's expected because he said that in all the previous correspondence that has been sent, it is not in that department. What I would prefer to see, um, and as Councillor Swift actually just raised about the Education Minister, I don't know if that was a proposal, but I'm, I'll second that. We need a targeted campaign on the Minister who actually has the responsibility for this scheme. I, as a teacher myself, I see firsthand the benefit um, of free school meals. And let me just say this as well, that no children uh, in a school will go hungry because, you know, the, the teachers have uh, pastoral care and do look out for the kids. You know, we're able to do our jobs. So I think it's been a wee bit disingenuous to, to, to say that. Um, the free school meals, the difference between primary and, and secondary in the primary school, um, a meal is, provi is provided for the child. In the secondary school, they're given an allowance um, so they can purchase their own meal. And um, the scheme is of no enormous benefit to children. Um, children in a learning environment need to be nourished and need to have um, a proper, healthy, nutritious food. So I I'm greatly in, in support of this scheme. However, I want to see the campaign directed to the proper uh, department. I mean, I think it's a bit um, ridiculous that um, we have some councillors coming in here and expressing uh, fa false disappointment. Um, this is a minister here, Minister of Finance, who has frozen the regional rates for two years in a row and who's went to great lengths to mitigate against the brutal, cruel Tory cuts that are being inflict inflicted um, right across um, England, Scotland and Wales. Um, thankfully, we've been able to mitigate against some of them here. Um, so I think that's extremely disingenuous coming from some of the other councillors, just to put that on, on record. Um, I, I would call that we have um, a focused, targeted campaign that we raise this directly with the Minister of Education. Uh, I think we should write to her now and request a meeting on this issue because we've, we we do know it's a serious issue and we've had the socioeconomic profile of the district. Um, indeed, there's rural deprivation, all these other factors affecting the Fermanagh district. And uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's uh, insurmountable that we should have uh, free school meals for all children. And I would agree with the sentiments around ending the social uh, class or any stigma that would be in, involved with these with this scheme. Um, so I, do, I think I'll just leave my comments there, but just to really bring in um, to attention that this letter is going to the wrong minister, it's going to the wrong department. This would be the equivalent of po putting your letter in the toaster and expecting it to be posted. It needs to be, go to the right department to be dealt with on a targeted campaign, uh, focus campaign to the Minister of Education, who is the only person who bears responsibility for this scheme. Gormogoth. Thank you. Next up, we have Councillor Anthony Finley. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realise my colleague Chris was coming in there when we're in the chamber. I don't know whose hands up, who's coming in, but just have to agree with everything he says. And I, what, I had no say what I was going to say, the exact same. And I wouldn't like Counts, uh, Councillor McNeil said there that you know, Conor Murphy doesn't care about uh, about about this subject. He don't. He don't. He does care about it. it, it it's not. It wasn't his remit, and Chris said that because. Um, 
and Sinn Féin is, is for free school meals for everybody, so I, I, I totally unaccept a comment like that coming, coming from any other councillors in the chamber. And Chris said that, like, Chris is a teacher and he, he sees it on, on the other hand, I'm a father, I have kids to school, not saying that I'd be looking for free school meals, but if it, it, if it was offered to people, it just, just and, and it's gone totally to the wrong, wrong person. They said that on the night of the meeting when it was proposed to write to the two ministers, and I, and I, I said, no, I wasn't agreeing with that. The whole lot was put out at hand then and said that we were against free school meals. We weren't against free school meals. We were against sending the letter to the wrong person and send it to the, the Minister for Education. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Next, we have Councillor Josephine Deham. Well, thank you, Chair. And it's been a very interesting uh, debate. Um, I certainly, uh, as a health professional, would advocate universal uh, free school meals for our children because, Chair, after all, our children are our future. And we all know that uh, in order for children to learn and develop and grow, uh, that they need to have a nutritionally balanced diet. And Councillor McCaffrey has already referred to how important it is that when children are in school in a learning environment, uh, that they are uh, well fed and able to avail uh, uh, maximally of the education that they are given. And notwithstanding, I'm sure our teachers do discharge their pastoral duties to children in terms of ensuring uh, that they are not hungry. I am aware that many families are struggling to feed their families and that situation will only get worse as we are faced with uh, rising energy costs, ri rising costs for transportation, rising costs for food. And as Councillor Coffey says, it is often the working poor who are most affected. So I believe that um, there should be provision of free school meals. Um, it will uh, um, dispel any social stigma associated with free school meals, and it will have very, very positive effects in terms of reducing bureaucracy. Um, I do support uh, Councillor Swift's proposal to write uh, to the Minister for Education. And I would also, if Councillor Swift was agreeable, to add to her proposal that we would write to other councils within Northern Ireland asking for their support uh, in this proposal because it's 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 a universal problem. It, it affects rural areas, it affects urban areas all over. And we learned today uh, some of the alarming statistics affecting our council area. It's something that we must be proactive on. Uh, so certainly I would be uh, in support of that uh, uh, proposal, Chair. Thank you. Okay, just to confirm that the, the proposal by Councillor Swift, that letter has already been sent to uh, the Department of Education. Um, so next we will move on to Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to, to uh, reiterate everything that, that has been said. Every councillor, and I'm proud of Fermanagh and Oma District Council, every councillor in this council was uh, for free school meals for all children, every single councillor. But there were some councillors went out and misinterpreted. And I, I looked on, on, uh, on social media and some of the abuse that some councillors got because of misinformation uh, from certain councillors was absolutely disgraceful. A, a, a personal abuse because of, and I, I'll, I'll say it outright, a, a total and utter lies that was being said that, that certain councillors were against free school meals. It, it was absolutely shocking. And, uh, and uh, they left it up on their Facebooks, they left it up on their social media, and they didn't correct it, and they let people be castigated on, on uh, social media. And it's absolutely disgraceful. And these councillors that did that and left that up on the, uh, that perception up there uh, should be ashamed of themselves. And I know some young councillors that got, uh, got uh, 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 absolutely atrocious abuse on social media. And it isn't right. And it, uh, these councillors should look in the mirror 
and and uh, 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 reveys what they what they they do on social media because it, it is absolutely disgraceful. And I'm really angry about 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 what some of the council, uh, some of our councillors did because everyone was for free school meals, and I'm angry about it. And and the councillors that did it should clarify it and get it up on social media because it it was pure lies that was being uh, put out there. And I'm not afraid to say that word. It was lies that was being uh, put out in social media. And I think our council has a duty of care to put out statements and clarify. Uh, actually what has been proposed and that and not let young councillors and people I'm old enough to look after myself and so, uh, uh, and I'm not saying the young councillors aren't but it's absolutely disgraceful that they are hung out to dry by utter lies and sorry I'm, I'm angry about this but uh, uh, it isn't right and the, uh, our council should do something about it. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I'm going to go back to the proposal and second of Councillor McAleer's proposal and second of Councillor O'Coffey uh, that, well, originally schools within the OMA area, but add any other uh, schools uh, that need to be added to it. Um, is everybody agreed with that proposal? Sorry, Victor, can you clarify exactly what that proposal is, please? Okay, Councillor McAleer, can you clarify your proposal, please? Certainly, Chair. Um, it's, it, yeah, as, as I stated earlier there, that I've been contacted by a number of parents who are concerned that their children at secondary schools, at post-primary schools in the home area, aren't actually getting the school meals that they're entitled to through uh, either being let out late from class or having to travel some distance from their classroom to the canteen area, then having to queue when they get to the top of the queue, the food's done out, whatever portions are there are gone. Or the, the second issue was that they were being allocated a monetary value, which in turn wasn't actually sufficient to cover the cost of their lunch. So it was really just a query. Those concerns that have been raised with me with the, the schools, post-primary schools in the home area. And just chair, if I could, in relation to the the proposal from Councillor Dehan in the middle of all that, I think it was in danger of being lost because um, the proposal from Councillor Swift was made previously. Maybe they were talking about the the letter being previously sent. I think the the proposal to address the the concerns to the other councils and see if we could get uh, all council bodies working together in relation to to this issue should be carried forward maybe if the if that element's all already gone i'm sure councillor swift and dehan are happy enough to propose that as a standalone element if not i'd be happy to propose or second as required um i'm not going to get into defend your minister at all costs or defend your party colleagues at all costs that seems to have got some people irate the the facts of previous uh, votes are a matter for public so, knowledge, let, so. let's stay away from that please councillor mcleary and deal with the votes in hand um councillor blake yeah well just for councillor mcleary needs to provide more clarity on who he wants to direct this letter at because part of the reason why is I agree with councillor green because there's a lot of in, misinformation spread on social media that some councillors that were subjected to a lot of abuse on it that was very, very hurtful to them when I seen the abuse that they had to take. So that's why Councillor McAleer needs to provide more clarity on this as to who this letter needs to be directed to so that people know what way they're voting. Chair, Chair if I could, on a point of clarity there, the, the reason I'm not naming particular schools is so that we can send a letter out across the board to see if this is common practice or it is just something that's been identified in one or two schools and um, that's why i've limited it to the oma area and um, as i said if it's happening in the anaskillen area or other areas of the district i'm happy to widen it out it's specifically to post primary schools in the oma area um, and it's to clarify or to confirm uh, what has been suggested by these parents so it's a fact thing corresponds i don't um i fail to see what the issue is that that some councillors seem to have and comprehend or supporting that but I'm, I'm happy to clarify further if needs be councillor mcguire i'm not going to carefully well i think the clarification uh, as i see it is that uh, we all have the authority as local councillors to contact the individual schools 
and uh, I would suggest that uh, the councillor would possibly do that as part of his own council remit and uh, not muddy the water in that there was a very clear and concise uh, proposal from councillor swift which uh, uh, I, I would suggest superimposes the, the councillor's uh, individual issues. I would suggest he could deal with them individually and that we as a council would support Councillor Swift's proposal, seconded by Councillor McCaffrey. And I believe in Councillor McCaffrey's submission there was some clarification as the distinction between primary and post-primary uh, funding for meals. I believe that clarification was there. So if I could suggest that, Chair, that we would uh, go with the uh, the major proposal of Councillor Swift, which is uh, something really we as a council should be involved in, and uh, suggest to the councillor that he deals with those local issues, as we all do in our own area. Councillor Ryan Hogan. No, sorry, Anne-Marie Fitzgerald. Yes, Chair, right. thanks, Victor. Victor, right. I'll be very... Hiya. Sorry, no, no, it's okay, Victor. Come here, I'll be very quick. Um, I know a lot of us is on a board of governors and um, school meals, whilst they're provided on the on the school facilities, they have no um, schools and the headmasters have no direct authority over them on secondary school level. I'm unsure about primaries, but secondary school level, um, school principals have no recourse over secondary school meals as through the education board, 100% fact. So um, I think to put the pr additional pressure on schools is unfair because it's factually incorrect that they have any um, authority over school meals in their premises. Thank you. What are we doing here? I'm bringing... Uh, Councillor Hollering Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, wasn't really going to speak on this, but as someone who works in a post primary school, um, schools are going over and above for each and every pupil. Well, I know any of the schools I have worked in, that's the case. Um, Councillor Fitzgerald's right. This is an issue for the Education Authority if it involves post primary schools, and I think we should direct it in that course. Um, it seems to me that we're going to tar all schools with the one brush, which would be totally unfair. Um, it's not something that I would favour doing anyway. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sean Clark. Yeah, no, I think it's been well covered. I, I'll let it go. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Councillor McAleer's proposal, uh, seconded by Councillor O'Coffey. Um, does everybody agree? No? Okay, there's dissent in the chamber and on uh, WebEx, so we are going to go to a vote on that. So can I ask uh, IT to set up the vote, please? And there's a request for a recorded vote. Chair, if I could clarify as well just what the vote is on in relation to just some of the sorry, comments. Sorry, yeah. Councillor McAleer, the vote has started, so we're going to have to we're going to have to let that continue, please. Chair, just for a, a question for clarity, was that the proposer wanting to clarify the proposal? Please. Well, that just makes her all concerned, confused now, Victor. Thanks, Chair.
Victor, I'm unable to vote. I'm pressing away here, but it's not recording my vote. So just owner, as anybody else has an issue, apologies for, for coming in. You have hit the submit button, okay? I'm not doubting you. No, no, no. I'm just, I've been pressing it, but I've got it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so the results of that vote uh, was 4 for 20, 23 against, so that falls. We'll now go on to Councillor uh, Swift's proposal, seconded by Councillor McCaffrey, that uh, we write to all councils to um, basically get their, get their uh, views on this. So is everybody agreeable with that proposal? Yes, Victor, it was uh, Josephine who had made that um, amendment to what I had said. And uh, to further state, I know while the letter has already previously been sent to the Minister for Education, I would question why she has failed to respond. Uh, Connor Murphy managed to respond to us, so it would do no harm to send a tentative reminder with okay. a priority exclamation mark attached to it, given the thrust of all members' discussion on this very important FSM issue, Gormagat. Uh, so sorry, Councillor Deacon, that was your proposal, seconded by Councillor McCaffrey, um, that we contact all councils to get their views. Is everybody happy with that proposal? Okay, that's agreed. Okay. Right, we're very nearly time here. Um, right, we just finished the uh, Matters Horizon, uh, page 16, page 17. Yes, Chair, there, there's an item of correspondence at 9.2.2 of the agenda uh, in relation to a response from the Western Health and Social Care Trust in relation to uh, training of general practice personnel. Uh, you'll see the Chief Executive has pointed the Council in the, in the uh, direction of the Senior Responsible Officer, Mr. Gary Cassidy, uh, who will... Um, for in relation to the training of, of the personnel queries that, that we raise. Okay, Councillor Deacon, just a reminder that we're very we're very close on time here. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd be brief. Well, just I propose we note the correspondence. I'm disappointed yet again in this response because uh, the, uh, Mr. Guckin did not address the issues uh, that we raised in our correspondence. Uh, the issues was uh, really seeking uh, action from the trust to progress accommodation issues and also uh, to engage the trust in providing the necessary personnel to support the multidisciplinary teams. And again, those issues have not uh, uh, been addressed. Um, I think probably, Chair, um, I propose that we uh, add this as an agenda item to our next meeting with the health and social care subcommittee, because uh, uh, clearly we, 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 we won't be getting a satisfactory answer from Mr. Guckian. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Councillor O'Coffey, again, we have one minute. Yeah, I'm content to second the noting of this correspondence and uh, my uh, I would in entirely agree with uh, the comments of Councillor Dehan there. It's um, shocking to be honest with you, but uh, hopefully something can be achieved. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 18, page 19 and page 20. Okay, um, I... 
There's one more item of correspondence. Uh, bear with us. Yes, Chair. It's um, just just in relation to an item on the other item of, of correspondence uh, in relation to the Fuel po Poverty Coalition event, uh, the energy and cost of living crisis to be held on the 13th of April in the, the MAC Theatre in, in Belfast, the copy attached. Okay, can I have any, uh, Councillor Blake? Proposed to note, Chair. Okay. Uh, Councillor Tommy Maguire. Well, Mark, like early, I, I do believe that uh, one of my councillor colleagues would like to attend that, Councillor Patrick Withers. Okay. Possible chair. Uh, is there a seconder in that, Councillor Anthony Feely? Uh, anybody else interested in, in um, attending that? Okay, if there is, contact the officers. Uh, I take it that proposal in second includes the noting of the correspondence as well. Okay, thank you very much. We have reached the end of our meeting, uh, another quite extensive one, and we didn't even get to the, the for information reports. Um, so thank you everybody for bearing with us, and we'll do it all again in four weeks' time. Bye bye. Okay, good night. <laughs> Night, Victor. Night, Victor.